Welcome to the Sherdog Radio Network preview for UFC Fight Night 231, Almeida versus Lewis, also known as UFC Sao Paulo. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of Sherdog.com. With me back once again after a week off is Keith Schillen, the executive producer of the Sherdog Radio Network. Keith, how are you doing? I know your weekend off wasn't a weekend off, so why don't you tell us what you did? Like, fight. Yeah, yeah it's good. Um, I, I had a good time this week. I hope you did too. Uh, I always enjoy get a little bit of time off, uh, but uh, Invicta was in Boston, so I had to go there, you know, fit in for once with my with my accent, not standing out too bad. So that was that was good. Uh, I got to do some interviews with some Invicta fighters. It's always good. Uh, I've never been to an Invicta show, so that was cool. Yeah, uh, Invicta, I, I still want to get out and see them, kind of in their home base of Kansas City, sometime just on Fight Pass. I know they do them two places now, the the Scottish Rite Temple and like the Policeman's Athletic Club, like the PAL Club okay. type thing. But both of them look cool as hell the way they set them up. I, I, that's something to scratch off the bucket list at some point. But uh, awesome. It's good to be back. And uh, the UFC is back. They're back in Sao Paulo. It's been a few years since uh, they've been there. And we'll talk about the specifics of how excited you are about the card in, in just a sec. But on paper... This is about the perfect Homer card. There are 13 fights. Every single fight has a Brazilian in it. None of them have two Brazilians. So there are no Brazilian on Brazilian matchups. We could conceivably be talking uh, at the end of the evening Saturday about a card where Brazilians went 13 and 0. And with a few exceptions, the UFC appears to be trying to set something like that up because the majority of the Brazilian fighters in this card are favorites. A couple of them are whopping favorites and only a few are unproven or or substantial underdogs having said that the big news about this card is that a couple of the main card fights changed up two weeks out Gilton Almeida had been scheduled to take on Curtis Blades Blades withdrew with an ankle injury Derek Lewis steps in on short notice and then uh, Kayo Bahalio had been scheduled to take on Nursultan Ruzboyev he dropped out actually on the exact same day. It was the ninth. So again, you know, like two or three weeks out from fight night and Abus Magomedov steps in. Do those two substitutions change your level of excitement for the card at all? Or does the machine just roll on? Um, yeah, the, the co-main event, I actually think it's a better matchup, um, at least name, at least name value wise, you know, with Magomedov coming off a, you know, main event in his last fight. As far as the main event, I actually think, I don't know if I'm more excited for the matchup because it's, it's it's an easier matchup for Almeida, and I, I might give my prediction, but stylistically, you would say it's an easier matchup. I mean, you know, besides the I can get put to sleep by the hardest hitter in the history of the sport. Yeah, but I think it makes more sense in the fact that, like, you know, striker versus grappler instead of grappler versus grappler, uh, where you know the guy who wants to get the fight to the ground, but he probably doesn't have a wrestling edge over Curtis Blades, where it'd be hard to get there. But the bigger part is it's a bigger name. Like Derek Lewis is, you know. Guy with the most knockouts in the history of the sport, you know, or, you know, his history of UFC, I should say. Yeah. And, you know, he's obviously a guy that's had, you know, mainstream appeal more because of what he says than actually what he does, though he's obviously really excited with his knockouts. You get a name, you got a win over like that, you know, he can get, he can say something funny and, and lead up to the fight. But if he, if he can, you know, dominate Lewis like he has everybody else in the UFC, I just think that does more for his career to to the general public than it would to the hardcores like us. Like us, if he could beat Curtis Blades, it would mean more to us. Sure. But to yeah. my friends, it would be more to beat Derek Lewis. Yeah. I mean, you and I are both probably, I, I mean, I think I speak for you in that we're both cautiously high on Jailton Almeida. Well, oh, absolutely. Hell, it's, it, it's not even long term. If he destroys Lewis or if he had destroyed Blades, he's not far down the speed dial for a title shot, but agreed from my point of view, as someone who watches literally every single UFC fight, if he went out there and ragdolled Curtis blades or just made blades look ineffectual, trying to take him down, my eyes get big. And I, all of a sudden I'm going, okay, what yeah. does Almeida versus oh. Aspinall look like? Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. It, it, I mean, if he, if he smokes, like if he smoked Curtis blades, we could be talking about the best fight in the world. You know yeah. the bad, you know baddest fight. As they were saying this week at, during the uh, uh, the absolute, <laughs> and I know I'm biased, but the absolute screw job of Francis Ngannou getting screwed <laughs> against place. I mean, I don't know how you scored it. I scored it for him. I mean, it wasn't screwed, but you have my point. But yeah, uh, 
I'm like, can I say something real quick? They, they kept seeing baddest man on the planet. And then, you know, the baddest man on the planet, you know, he resides in England. Yeah. And his name is Tom Aspinall. Bingo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. It could be John Jones. Could be. Could be. Insert help. You, you guys. Yeah. My, you know what I'm saying. It's Completely fit, fit the tweet a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other general thoughts on this card, or a, a better question? Outside of Almeida versus Lewis, Bahalio versus Magomedov, uh, what? fight would you say you're most excited for uh, on this card or what individual fighter which individual well, fighter? the card in general i mean i think it's a fantastic fight night card like i'm really excited i mean maybe it's being uh you know off for two weeks you know you know what they say absence makes the heart grow fonder so maybe a little bit of that but when i go down the card i mean you got the bonfin brothers both of them who are who are you know exciting guys uh you have you know, action guys like uh, Zaleski versus Fakradinov. Uh, you know, that's for a prelim fight. That one's really obviously it's, jumping out to me. Vitor uh, Petrino, who sometimes looks like the next Almeida. Yeah, so, like there's yeah. a good, there's some good fights on this card. Like, I if I if you were asking me to score this, you know, on a for a fight night scale, it, I mean, any, all right, let me go back up. Like the Bonfin brothers, mm-hmm. they're you know two guys that everyone's super excited about, but they also have very tough tests. Like veteran tough test like nicholas dalby is a tough out for anybody like mm-hmm. he's not a world champion he's not a you know a upper echelon guy but he's a you beat nicholas dalby that's a solid win yes you know you beat i mean vince michelle is old and and he's he doesn't fight often but when he does he's he's tough as nails like so i'm gonna give this card like an a minus like i'm excited same here uh a minus i i could by the time we're done talking about it, I may have to revise that to just an A, as in this is about as good as it gets for a fight night card. You've got a headliner with immediate title implications. You've got a couple of the hottest prospects in their respective divisions. You've got a couple of, like you said, almost guaranteed action fights. This is it. Like, check check all the boxes. This is about as good as a fight night gets. Yeah, um, hell, how many people would have to be injured for that headliner to be for like an interim title? And all of a sudden this is a, a C minus like a pay-per-view, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, with, with, uh, with John Jones uh, being out for who knows how long he's been and, and who knows with John Jones, he may never fight again. Not, not, and I'm not one of those guys saying, oh, his career's over. I'm not doing that. Like they did that. Right. I just mean like he doesn't fight a lot anyways. So it wouldn't be, you know, out, out of the realm of possibility with Stipe Miotic. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know the behind the scenes thing there, but he's, he's now not fighting for the title after Aspinall and, um, Oh, I can't think of the big Russian's name that he's fighting the killer there. <laughs> the kid knockout rush, the Russian guy. Knocks Sergey out. Pavlovich. Sergey Pavlovich. Yeah. After those guys, I mean, it could be Almeida if he wins. Yeah. It's, it's a hell of a card. John Jones, you know, he's out for a long time, and and Steve doesn't want to fight. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, guys, you know, I know you got like Volkov and guys like that, but he'd be the he's the one that people would be excited if he smokes Derek Lewis. He's the one people would be talking about, you know. And if he smokes Derek Lewis, and they booked him against someone like Volkov, he's going to walk in there as like a four to one favorite. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, do you want to dig into this thirteen fight card? Yep, let's do it. All right. First up at UFC Fight Night 231 is a lightweight matchup between the debuting Cauê Fernandez and Mark Jacquesi. Fernandez, the 28-year-old Brazilian, is 8-1 and one overall. He fought most recently back in March at LFA 154, where he racked up a head kick that if you see it, you'll probably remember it because it made the rounds, it went viral, it was on Fight Pass, but, you know, therefore Fight Pass tweeted it out. Kaposa tweeted it out. Just gorgeous head kick where he kind of on the break brings up a, a head kick on the blind side and just iced Felipe Douglas. Uh, he was signed by the UFC pretty soon after that. And here he makes his debut and gets a pretty stiff test right out the gate in the form of Jacquesi. 30 year old Brit is 16 and 7 overall. He is an even 7 and 7 since joining the UFC as the outgoing Bama lightweight champ. He's on a two fight losing streak at the moment. Uh, dating back uh, just a little under a year. He comes to this fight off of back-to-back losses to Michael Johnson and Joel Alvarez. The most recent of those, the Alvarez fight, was back in July. He got tapped out late in the second round with a Bravo choke. 
Odds here, uh, I mentioned off the top that there are 13 Brazilians on this card and most of them are favorites. This is one of the rare exceptions as Jacquezi comes in around minus 135, Fernandez available just above even money at plus 115. Uh, for a guy that has conducted quite a lot of his career in respectable, prominent regional promotions like LFA and Shudo Brazil, tape is relatively thin on Cowie Fernandez. And it's even more difficult because he has a brother named Kawa Fernandez, who's very close in age, looks kind of like him, and is a Bantam weight. So I, I watched probably three or four minutes of tape on the wrong guy before I realized what I was doing. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Kawa Fernandez sets up orthodox. I see him as a good athlete, um, just fast, coordinated, uh, smooth. He's not huge. He debuted at featherweight slowly kind of grew into a lightweight body. He's not a huge lightweight, but uh, willing to throw on the feet. Um, my One of my notes was like, nice jab, but overreaches. And then about two minutes later, actually overreaches on a lot of his punches. Uh, he, he's got that kind of thing. And it's a thing that you see often in raw strikers that they'll sometimes outgrow, where be, wanting not to get hit, they'll kind of reach in from too far away with their strikes. And that's almost the opposite of what you should do. Cause then your chin is a full foot out, you know, past your feet, uh, good low kicks that he's willing to throw enough to make a difference in a fight, uh, solid takedown defense. Thanks a lot to his athleticism. Like he sprawls like an American wrestler uh, on some of these guys that have tried to take him down. Just really good at getting his hips out of the way. Uh, considering that he's 28, it's a little late for the super young prospect thing, but as a guy with under 10 fights, he feels like he's still coming along from fight to fight. And here in Jacasey, I'm kind of surprised they matched him this, this tough out the gate because Jacasey is a guy who from one fight to the next is capable of looking like a world beater or kind of a bum. And almost all of it is up to Mark Jacasey. Uh, I think I said this last time he fought, yeah, I'm sure I said this last time he fought. I can't believe Mark Jacquezzi is only 30 years old. Every time he fights, I expect him to be like 36 or 37, just because he feels like he's been in the UFC for 12 years. Uh, and I mean, he's been in the UFC for a while. <laughs> His fights seem like they're 12 years long. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> I, like, I feel like I age a year every time he fights. So, <laughs> uh, And Keith right there nailed it right on the head. He looks like a comic book character. He looks like a character, like a mid-level boss from like a superhero, like a Marvel superhero movie, but he can be agonizingly low output and just kind of inert unless he's got a fighter who takes it to him and forces him to, uh, to fight. And the funny thing is he tends to do well in those situations, unless it's a much, much better fighter when guys like Slava Borshov or Demir Hajovic, Leno Venata, like is unwilling to tolerate a boring fight, he handles him. But he's often just too willing to kind of stand back and lose a fight round by round, uh, you know, if his opponent doesn't force anything out of him. I think Fernandez is going to come right at Jacasey. And if he is not kind of cleaned up his defensive lapses, if he's still throwing single strikes from too far outside by reaching out way over his feet, Jacasey is exactly the kind of guy who's just going to hit him with a short counter and put him down face down. Uh, Jacasey has sneaky good wrestling just because I think of how quick and strong he is, and he's shown himself willing to turn to it sometimes. I don't think he'll get far with that against Fernandez. I kind of expect this to turn into a Mark Jacasey fight where unless Fernandez makes a big mistake and gets hurt bad, I think he's going to win rounds just by being the guy who's coming forward, throwing a lot more volume than uh, Jacasey. I'm going to go with the slight upset here and say Fernandez wins in kind of a ho-hum fight. But again, my second most likely outcome would be that Jacasey punishes him for one of those risky shots and just lamps him. And if he does that, I'm going to look silly, but just understand that I recognize that it's a big possibility. But yeah, give me Fernandez by decision here. Wow. <laughs> that would excite the, you know, Fernandez winning in Brazil would excite the crowd right away. Uh, obviously, Brazilians have a very fun, rowdy crowd to begin with. Uh, obviously, a lot of pride in, in Brazil. Uh, Dia Casey, oh my God, he's, to me, he's everything the opposite of what he's advertised. 
you know, he's like, he's obviously he's a good athlete and everything. He's, he's you know, you look at him, this ripped up dude, you know, he gets credited as this big power puncher, but he's, he's more of a technical striker. He can fight out of both stances. His hands are quick, but dude, can he be gun shy? I mean, he fights at a snail's pace. I mean, we, we saw that against Michael Johnson where he just let Michael Johnson, a guy that you can catch on a chin and put out at any time who, a guy who, fights to lose like he he's got to find a way to lose if you if, if, you know and the case you just let him out volume on uh and he, he shouldn't be losing to a michael johnson at this point in his career when he actually lets his hands go he's pretty good i mean i, I like his straight right i i like i like that he goes to the body i mean you look at him he's physically strong but he's he's like i said he's not this power puncher that the u.s is going to make him sound like you know um i would say he actually lacks power he's more of a, a you know point striker now his calf kicks are dangerous like i like his calf kicks he's a very good calf kicker uh, i like when he gets in the pocket and he throws step in knees and stuff uh, i like that he, when he gets in the pocket looks for elbows he's a very good wrestler and, and i mean his penetration step you know it's good he knows how to chain wrestle uh go back to like to the mayor hazard he, he wants strictly by just taking him down or holding him down um but I mean, he holds and stalls. <laughs> you know, he's he doesn't do much when he's on top, uh, because he's not a traditional like NCAA wrestler. He does have to improve his top control if he tries to advance position and stuff. That's when he he lets people out. But a lot of times he won't. He'll just hold on and, and not do much. Uh, he's hard to take down himself, and if taken down, he does well to get back to his feet. But a big issue with him is his submission defense. I mean, he's been caught in a lot of submissions. Alfie Alves caught him submission. Dan Hooker caught him submission. Joel Alvarez caught him submission. And they all caught him with, like, head attacks, like Darce chokes and guillotines. Uh, it's something that he needs to be aware of. Uh, Fernandez, I th- I'm glad that Fernandez is brought to the UFC. He's he's fought some pretty good competition. And, and uh, you yeah, know, he's got a lot of ex- – I don't want to say a lot of experience, but he's got, you know, decent experience on the regional scene. Uh, good athlete. He moves well. Uh, got some good power. Uh, defensively, he's got a lot of holes he's, that he needs to clean up. He keeps his chin high in the air. He lacks head movement. I, I, I'm back to his like his only career loss. I mean, he he got hurt a lot in that fight. So uh, that's something that's – and that wasn't that long ago either. Uh, so that's not very encouraging. Um, I like his kicking game. Um, he's got some mean kicks. You mentioned his knockout kick in his last fight. It was an incredible high kick. I love – it was a high kick, but it wasn't from space. It was in close. Like they were, they were like breaking – uh, free from like a combination when you throw it, which was which is really fun to see. Uh, he will wrestle. He looks for upper body takedowns. Uh, if he gets to fight to the ground, he advances position. He's a BJJ black belt. Um, can be a little too confident in his BJJ. Like I've seen him pull guard to get the fight to the ground, uh, and and he does move well off his back. He's got some submissions off his back. Um, problem is he he if he's pinned down like his one loss, he struggled to get back up, and and he also gassed in that fight. So, you know, Fernandez looks like. I don't know if he's a UFC talent now, and I know that I was actually having this conversation with a guy um, from Severe MMA uh, this week when he was talking about certain people who should be in the UFC from Victor and everything. And I was like, well, you know, this person is a UFC level talent, but so is, you know, we've said this before, so is 3,000 other fighters in, in the world. That's so, like, he, I feel he feel, fits in that category, but he seems more like a guy that could, you know, get a win in the contender series instead or be on the Ultimate Fighter show or something like that. DKS is good, and that's a tough test, you know, in your first match in UFC. I think it's kind of a little bit of weird matchmaking. So after, like, back-to-back losses, I I think DKS is going to play it safe, do do what he does best. And I I think he's going to look like Bo Nickel out there. I think he's going to get some takedowns. I think he's going to, you know, and he's just going to win, like, a like I think it's going to be a whole home decision, as you said. I just think it's going to be for the other way. I'm going to say DKS wins a uh, unanimous decision back down this wrestling. Next up on the UFC Sao Paulo prelims, we have a strawweight matchup between the debuting Eduardo Moura and Montserrat Conejo Ruiz. Moura, the 29-year-old Brazilian, is a perfect 9-0 as a professional. As I said, this will be her debut. This card, I'm pretty sure these are the first alums of the 2023 season of Dana White's Contender Series to show up in the UFC. Uh, And I'm also pretty sure that she is the second fighter nicknamed Ronda on the UFC roster right now. You knew it was coming. When Ronda Rousey was arguably, well, inarguably one of the two biggest stars in the sport and arguably the biggest, 
in like 2015. You knew this was coming eight years or so later. We have multiple yeah. women named Ronda, nicknamed Ronda in the UFC right now. Why don't we have like women, you know, like that debuted four or five years ago named Megumi? How come that, how come that was nobody's nickname? I don't know, but that would have been awesome. Wouldn't that <laughs> be great? Up. I mean, Nisha Megumi Tate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, she fought on the Contender Series back in August, choking out Janina Silva late in the first round to punch her ticket to the UFC. And then she is on this show in particular, mostly because your headliner, Jayutan Almeida, who is her uh, who is her teammate at Galpola Luta, which for those who don't follow Portuguese, that just means the fight shack. Anyway, he lobbied heavily for her to be on this card in Sao Paulo. The UFC uh, granted that wish, and here she is against Ruiz. A 30-year-old Mexican is 10 and 3 overall. She is 1 and 2 in the UFC since joining out of uh, Invicta a little over 2 years ago. She is coming into this fight on back-to-back -back losses. She got knocked out in the first round by Amanda Lemos back in summer of 2021, then came back this August and got knocked out on the ground in the third round by Jackie Amarim. So, she's looking to bounce back from a two-fight skid. She is decidedly not favored to get that done as Mora is minus 500 Ruiz plus 375 and spoiler Keith this isn't even the widest line on the card it might not even be the second widest line on the card there there are some whopping favorites further up this card having said that this is one where I totally get why the line is what it is because this is an absolutely horrible stylistic matchup for Montserrat Ruiz uh, I mean Ruiz is undersized she looks like she could make adam weight physically strong and super super short and she i mean her best win career-wise is her last win in ufc where she or in invicta where she tapped out janeza Moranjan and, and did it with a scarf hold arm lock she brought that scarf hold to the ufc ran into cheyenne at the time bays nailed her with that uh that uh same scarf hold throw what i think without exaggeration was five or six times in the fight uh you know put cheyenne on her back quickly and more often than i won't even make the joke but uh <clears throat> that wasn't going to be a path to long time success in the ufc she ran into amanda lemos next okay you get a pass on that one amanda lemos is a recent high level title picture contender yeah you're going to get blown out in 35 yeah, seconds just go for the title yeah, yeah th thank you. An actual title challenger. <laughs> well, well, kind of for the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sh showed up for the title. Uh, Jackie Amarim is a more concerning look, especially as regards her chances against Morda, because Amarim showed that not only does Ruiz not have much of a plan B if she can't hit that headlock throw, but she is kind of hapless when she is the one that gets taken down and put on her back. Uh, Amarim absolutely steamrolled Ruiz. I had 10, eight rounds in rounds one and two, and it was 100% by Amarim taking Ruiz down, advancing position, pelting her with ground and pound, like moving to mount. And she's going against someone here in Mora that is pretty good grappler. Uh, Eduardo Mora d has done exactly what you would want a prospect, especially a prospect who is starting in their mid to late twenties to do. Cause she debuted as a professional 19 months ago and she has fought nine times since then. Nine times in, uh, she basically fought every other month for the last year and a half to get uh, nine fights under her belt. There's tape on her is a little thin, but early in her career, she was ultra, ultra raw. There's actually more grappling footage of her from before her MMA debut than there is video of her first four or five uh, MMA fights, but uh, she's strong, has a pretty good takedown game for a jujitsu person. Like even in her grappling uh, matches, she looked like someone who might be able to make a decent transition to MMA because she's pretty athletic and good at getting the fight to the ground on her terms. And her, I mean, her uh, win against Duda Santana, almost exactly a year ago where she tapped her out in the first round. That's kind of my key to what the Ruiz fight was going to look like because Morta took Santana down within the first 30 seconds or so. And she didn't get the tap until 
like four full minutes later, but the entire round was like one of those nature documentaries where you watch a python swallowing a goat and it takes like three hours and they do the time lapse footage to see like the goat stops kicking about yeah, halfway yeah. through. <laughs> just she never risked her position, just this slow, inexorable advance uh, until she finally, you know, threatened with mount, took her back, choked her out. I think that's exactly what this fight is going to look like. She's going to take Ruiz down. This may be one of those fights that ends in the first round and there's not a single significant strike landed on the feet. It, it could be one of those, but I think Mora is going to take Ruiz down, advance, like, you know, move to move to mount, take the back, choke her out. And it's again, just going to look like some predator from a, a nature documentary. I don't know what her long-term upside is, but she's going to look like Rhonda on Saturday night. Give me Morda by first round submission here. Yeah, well, I think if she looked at oh, Ronda, Ronda would finish it in like a minute. Like that was her one that was her one claim to fame or, or not even a minute. I mean, Ronda was on a run. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? like, what, 16 like, seconds for uh Yeah, it's like th I think it was like three fights under under a minute combined. Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll be like watching a, a Ronda Rousey fight in slow motion. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Paul, yeah. Uh we get DVD got stuck or something. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm a little higher on Ruiz than you are. Not not that uh, I'm not that high on her, but you would have to be. I think she's terrible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's she's got physical tools. Like she's physically strong. Uh, she's southpaw. She has high volume on it on, on her. You know, on the feet, good hand speed. I love that she attacks with combinations, but defensively, she has a lot of holes. Uh, she, you know, she lacks head movement. It'd be the biggest thing she can wrestle offensive wrestler she's she's pretty good at it. like she's got some upper body takedowns uh the problem is she's got too much of that and how do i say this without sounding extremely sexist like uh, i think you can say girl takedowns if that's what you're trying yeah, to say, I don't well, say like, it's she's not headlocks it's, like it's it's a it's not that women can't shoot a proper takedown it's that there's so much less infrastructure for long amateur wrestling backgrounds before you become a fighter yeah exactly yeah like yeah, I, mean, I mean you and i are old enough to remember when it was remarkable that misha tate had wrestled in high school yeah, yeah you exactly. know yeah yeah exactly yeah that's a good point a very good point so you know, she'll do stuff like that but you mentioned she's a weak defense wrestler uh, i mean emeron took her down with ease uh, if she ends up on top because she's physically strong, I mean, she battered uh, Sh Cheyenne Dolitzi on the ground with with some ground and pound. Uh, she she does have some submission wins. If she, if she is put on her back, she she struggles to get back up. Um, she did show some submission defense against Amarin, like she was submitted and you know being on her back for fifteen minutes. Uh, move over to Mora. Uh, one thing that stands out for me, she, like you talked about Marie's, you know, uh, Ruiz being show up. Mara's big for the weight class. I mean, she's a mm -hmm. muscular woman. Uh, she's got some decent pop in her hands. Though she does keep her chin too high, for, you know, and open for some big shots. Uh, on the feet, she's very aggressive. But me, mainly her aggression is to close a distance. She understands, like, I got a strike to hide myself. She's got some good entries. Um, good top control. You mentioned it. She's um, Jelton Almeida's teammate. She fights like him. <laughs> Like she controls on the ground, advances very well on the ground. Uh, you know, you, her ground pound was really good on the contender series. That's the only thing I, I'd say was, you know, you're saying that, you know, she could, could just control. Like she batted on the contender series. Uh, and she's a serious, serious, you know, submission threat. I, I think it's, I think it's a good first, you know, first fight for someone that I, I feel pretty good about, you know, coming into the UFC and, and Mara. The, from, from what I've seen, uh, you know, my issue with Ruiz is her inability to, you know, to keep the fight from going to the ground. I know Mora's going to try to get the fight to the ground. I think she does. I think she batters on the ground. I think she eventually locks in a submission. So I'm actually going to say it doesn't go to decision. I'm going to say Mora gets a second round sub. We stay in the strawweight division for our next matchup as it features Angela Hill versus Denise Gomez at strawweight. Hill, the 38-year-old Maryland native by way of San Diego, is 15 and 13 Overall, she is 10 and 13 since joining the UFC as a former Invictus strawweight champ and a veteran of the 20th season of the Ultimate Fighter. She is coming into this fight off of a loss 
uh, she dropped a unanimous decision to Mackenzie Dern in the headliner of Fight Night 223 back in May. Prior to that, she had won back-to-back -back fights over Lupi Godinez and Emily Ducote. She will look to get back on track here against Gomez. 23-year-old Brazilian is 8-2 and two overall. She is 2-1 and one since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. She is on a two-fight win streak. She lost her UFC debut to Loma Lagunmi a little over a year ago. Since then, she has back-to-back -back knockouts of Bruna Brazil and Yasmin Haragi. Uh, the most recent of those, the Haragi fight, was at UFC 290 back in July. So Gomez looking to make it 3-0, uh, three, oh, three wins in calendar year 2023. She is ever so slightly favored to do so as she comes in around minus 140, Hill plus 110. Uh, Keith, I'm going to flip this one to you first, but I don't know where Gil Parana finds these women. There must be some factory near Niederoy that just cranks out short, powerful, explosive yeah. women with neck tats and cornrows. Yeah. I, like, I, I'm sure he keeps the location a secret so nobody gets them. Yeah. But uh, is Denise Gomez the next Jessica Andrade, Carl Hosa wow. type? And is Hill the person to teach us whether she is or not? Yeah, Cal Hosa maybe. I mean, saying just kind of Josh. I mean, that's well. There's a spectrum in between there. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you'd rank her all time, but probably a top ten female fighter of all time. Yeah, ish, ish. I should say. Yeah, I'm not counting them off my head, but you know, somebody who's been extremely successful in the sport. Yes. Um, but I like her. But this is a tough test. I mean, say what you want about Angela Hill. You know, like if you. One thing about Angel Hill has always been proven: if you beat Angel Hill, you're good. If you don't, then you're not. <laughs> you know, or you're, or, or you, I don't see you're not good, but you're, you're a big step down. You know, she's the. I hate using gatekeeper. I just hate that word because there's so many definitions. You know, everyone has. Like, there's like eight levels. I, <laughs> you know what I always think of when I say gatekeeper? I'm just gonna show. I, I don't know if I've said this before to you. Um, but you're old enough to remember the, the never-ending story where he had to go through the little stages. Oh. Are you talking about those two statues that, like that shot the lasers from? Oh, dude! Yeah, but that was like the first stage, so that's like that's like getting the UFC gatekeeper, and then the second one, which I still never understood, with the like looking at himself in a mirror, mirror. kind of weird thing. Yeah, that was yeah. after the after the people who shot lasers were so badass. The second stage, which was just even more deadly, was like the corniest thing ever. But yeah. uh, but there you go. That's but the dude, next yeah, stage. Yeah, like, you know, be be the gatekeeper that shoots the laser eyes because when he rode by the person that got <laughs> killed and like he was all charred inside his helmet, dude. I had nightmares about that when I was eight years old. <laughs> oh. How many how many people think are old enough to get this reference? I I don't know. I don't know. I'll you, say you, about you already this. said I'll... something about a DVD player getting stuck. Like yeah, they, they know the words not, grandpas yeah, over here. Yeah, some people not get that either. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I should have said like streaming gets frozen for a second. Yeah, you know. Um, talk about you know people always talk about certain movies that were great and then the sequel is terrible. You ever see? The second never yeah. I couldn't get past like 20 minutes in. It's bad. Yeah. Anyways, there was uh, got some budget there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, let's. They didn't get one of those. They didn't get one of those Bud Light deals. Um, I mean, Angela Hill, you know, I feel we've broken down her so many times and, and nothing, nothing has changed. <laughs> you know, it's the same, the same notes, just me, instead of saying high volume, say high output this time, just to see like I did more, more deep study on her, you know? So it's, I, I mean, that's how she fights. She wins, she wins with volume. I mean, you check out her fight against Emily Dakota. It was probably the most recent example of, of where she wins with her, where their volume. I mean, she, she's the definition of a distance point fighter. Uh, she moves well. Works behind a jab, good head movement, slip and rip kind of, you know, fighter with her right hand being her best, like kind of, you know, slip kind of right hand. Uh, I also do like her her check left hook. I like that she goes to the body. Though um, you were talking earlier about, uh, I think it was Fernandez overextending. Uh, Angela Hill, for her, who's, a, you know, known for a strike, she could overextend sometimes on her punches, leaving herself for counters. Uh, underrated Muay Thai clinch game, uh, you know, go back to like, the Dakota fight, she beat her up there. Oh, uh, the Loma Lubumi fight, you know. Loma Lubumi, yeah. yeah. Framing, blasting with knees. Uh, she's, you know, good at that. Not much of an awesome offensive grappler and one of the worst defensive wrestlers in, in women's MMA. Uh, it's it's why she can't get over the hump. I mean, it's always the case. How does Angela Hill lose? She gets out wrestled by Ronda Marcos and Claudia Gadelia and Michelle Watterson and Fernandez Andaroba and Mackenzie Dern and 
you know. Uh, in fairness, that last one, she wasn't subbed by Mackenzie Zern, so, I mean, that's a pretty good accomplishment. Move over to uh, Denise Gomez. Uh, Denise, say, if I'm saying her name wrong, I apologize. Uh, she's she's a high output kickboxer herself. She fights, you know, somewhat similar on the feet than Angela Hill. She's constantly moving. Uh, she throws harder, though. She throws some hard shots. Also, slip and rip style. She does pillar defense, which I'm, you know, I'm not crazy on. She also has a very boxing heavy style, so she's heavy on a front foot, which leaves her open to leg kicks, which is could be a major issue against someone like Angel Hill. But because she's heavy on the front foot, she generates a lot of power off that front foot. Uh, she hits hard. Uh, she sits on her punch as well. Uh, she loves her overhand right. So actually, I shouldn't say she fights. I, I should have just said she's a striker. I shouldn't have said. She fights like Angel Hill because they have a different style of, of striking. But uh, I was trying to make the point for you. We could see a stand-up battle. Uh, she, she, you know, she gets inside and she throws these short, tight hooks. Um, so she's got some power there. Good calf kicks. She got a good. I mean, not necessarily a great high kick. It's probably her best tool. Um, you check out her her knockout win on the Contender Series. Uh, she she does do some stu- you know stupid dumb spinning attacks, which you know I've never really been a fan of. Uh, she can wrestle too. She has some good entries, though she's not a very good defensive wrestler. Uh, one thing we talked about in the past is she looks for a switch when defending takedowns, which simply does not work in MMA because of the rule. The rules we've talked about this before. You can lock hands in in, in MMA, and you can't do that in in amateur wrestling, which changes uh, your ability, or I shouldn't say completely eliminates your chance of getting a switch. It just it, it makes it much harder. Uh, she also she also got hell locked on by Loma Lubumi, uh, which is which is not good, um, but she's hard to hold down and she's got a really good gas tank. So uh, I'm actually torn on this one, and, and I hate picking Angel Hill fights. Just I don't know. I just, I'm not the, the, they're not the most exciting fights usually. They're kind of you know boring kickboxing match. Uh, being that. We're in Brazil, being that Gomez is only 23. I'm also, I always wonder about the fighters who've been in the UFC for a long time and they win one, they lose one, they win one, they lose one. They've kind of have to come to the realization they'll never be a champion. They kind of know what they are. I always wonder about that motivation, you know, how much, you know, when it gets really hard, how much do you put that time in the gym? And I'm not, obviously, I'm not accused, I'm just guessing, I'm not saying she doesn't. Uh, and then also, Gomez having the wrestling advantage. And the power advantage, I'm going to pick Gomez to win. Uh, but I'm going to say it's going to be a really close decision. I'm going to say one of those Angel Hill type fights. Uh, I'll say Gomez wins by split decision. Yeah, I found myself nodding along with just about every point there. And you're right. I, I would have to do the math and do some counting. But it's definitely possible that we have previewed more Angela Hill fights than any other fighter because she's been in the UFC the whole time we've been doing this show. Like, I'm sure we've done 11 or 12 of her fights. And it's either her or Kevin Holland. Yeah, either her or Kevin. And the thing is, a couple of Kevin Holland fights were on short enough notice that they might not have been on our preview. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, and you're right. The scouting report hasn't changed much. Uh, it's only changed in the ways that you would kind of expect as a fighter in a speedy, speedy division would change as she ages from 35 to 38. Uh, you, but the the path to beating Angela Hill has always been the same. Take her down. Take her down, take her down, take her down. And as she's aged, and you know maybe as her approach has changed a little bit, her takedown defense has gone from below average. I would say when she entered the UFC, it was below average. It was you know a four out of ten. but it it wasn't absolutely abysmal because, well, you know, she was strong in the clinch. It wasn't a safe place to try to take her down from there. And she was active enough on the feet that you had to have at least a decent shot to actually get at her hips. But it's gone from below average to maybe the worst in that division of, of any decent fighter. In fact, I'm comfortable saying that. Of, of any decent fighter in the strawweight division, she has the worst takedown defense. The question is, how easy or hard does her opponent want to make it on themselves to pursue that? We are barely a year removed from her winning a mystifying decision over Lupi Godinez, who had the most obvious route to victory of any. Yeah, don't remind me. It's, well, you and I were both just like, this is a terrible matchup for Hill. Lupi Godinez is the best wrestler in the division and specifically in ways that are going to make it tough for Hill because she doesn't need the clinch to get takedowns. She is 
the antithesis of what we just barely talked about, where there are so few women that come from a long time amateur wrestling background. Godinez is the opposite. She is a decorated amateur wrestler that has a beautiful shot from the outside. And we watched her not do it for 15 minutes. <laughs> just, uh, you know, Hill, she's still competitive. Almost like when was the last time Angel Hill just really, really got blown away? It was the random Marcos fight. The random Marcos fight was five years ago almost. Uh, her back to back wins over Godinez and Dakota, like she's the one that first kind of threw a rock on the tracks of the Dakota hype train in the UFC. But it's hard to feel comfortable picking her here against Denise Gomez. Uh, because even if Gomez decides for some reason not to take advantage of Hill's takedown defense, Gomez throws enough volume on the feet and will land with a heavier effect when she does land that it would be tough for Hill even to win that chip away and win three low power kick rounds of kickboxing type win. Like it, it would be tough for her to get the kind of win she got against Godinez or Dakota just because Gomez is more aggressive on the feet, throws more volume, and throws harder. So I, I'm leaning towards Gomez by decision here as well. Uh, yeah, uh, the the Angela Hill show may finally be winding down, but she's, like you said, good, uh, good gatekeeper. They're all different kinds of gatekeepers. I mean, hell, you can call Alexander Volkov a gatekeeper, and he's probably the fifth or sixth best heavyweight in, or you know, top-ranked heavyweight in the UFC right now. He's the gatekeeper to the title picture. There are people who are gatekeepers for the top 15. There are people who are gatekeepers to the UFC. If you can't beat Chase Sherman, you don't belong in the UFC. Uh, Hill is the gatekeeper to the top 15, and Gomez can kind of prove she belongs there if she wins an uncontroversial decision over Hill, which is what my pick is. Next up, we head to the light heavyweight division for a matchup between the undefeated Vitor Petrino and Modestus Bukowskis. Petrino, the 26-year-old Brazilian, is a perfect 9-0 as a professional. He is 2-0 since joining the UFC out of the 2022 season of Dana White's Contender Series. His victims in the big octagon have been Anton Tercali, uh, whom he beat back in March, and Martin Pracnio, whom he choked out in the third round at UFC 290 back in July. He will look to make it three in a row at the expense of Bukowskis. A uh, 29-year-old Lithuanian by way of England is 15 and five overall. He is three and three across two separate stints in the UFC. He's two and zero oh this time. Uh, he appeared in the UFC as an outgoing Cage Warriors light heavyweight champ a couple of years ago. Went one and three. Didn't look all that great got cut, went back to Cage Warriors, won their light heavyweight title again, and got signed again. And since being back, he is 2-0 with decision wins over Tyson Pedro and Zach Palga. The most recent of those, the Palga fight, was back in June at UFC on ESPN, Vittori versus Cannoneer. So he'll be looking to make it 3-0 uh, in this run as well. He is not favored to get it done. Uh, Petrino is minus 225, Bukowska's plus 175. Keith, I kind of said offhand earlier on this preview that Petrino in some ways looks like he could be the next Dialton Dial Almeida. I just meant that in the broad strokes of uh, he is at this point undefeated. Almeida was on a long win streak. They're both just physical specimens yeah. who parlay that into wins. Right now, Dialton Almeida is edging in on the title picture in his division. Do you see that kind of upside for Petrino, uh, you know, as, as he continues? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I don't think UFC does being that he's this far down, uh, you know, on the card. It, 205 is one of those ones, you know, 205 and 185 is kind of, it, it actually heavy. probably those three divisions. The answer is a lot easier to say yes than if we're talking bantamweight, featherweight, lightweight, in both weight, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he's 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 got that potential, you know? Um, you know, I always want to remind people, it's, it's not me predicting he's going to win the title, you sure. know, but being that he, it's more of my way of saying, like, he could be a ranked 205-pounder, you know, in the sure dog rankings one day. Um, but he's... 
you know, I'm always worried about those early losses. A guy like Bukasis is, 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 you know, he's a, he's a good technical fighter. I mean, he, he can fight from distance. He moves well. Um, he, he wants to keep his, his distance and, and he hates being pressured. We've seen that. Uh, but to his credit, he's one of these guys. He actually can strike while backing up. Uh, he f- fights out of both stances. He's a good counter striker. Uh, his hands are, you know, fairly fast, though he can be gun shy at times. I mean, I always think about that, like Tyson Pedro fight. Like, uh, you know, he was gun shy against Tyson Pedro. You know, for 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 Pete's sake. Like, uh, when he lets his hands go, he he throws short, tight shots down the pipe. And and I, I know something I want I want to address. And I know I say some guys who are gun shy. Some of it's the understanding of their cardio, which could be an issue. You know, they know how they're trying to pace themselves a little bit, which which could be the case. Um, <laughs> Though if you if that is the case, don't throw spinning back attacks like he likes to do. Uh, <laughs> he, he's got a good kicking game. You know, he rips the body with kicks. He's got some nice calf kicks. Uh, not much of an offensive wrestler, and he's a weak defensive wrestler. But to his credit, he's hard to hold down. Um, he likes he 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 has a little bit of that uh, we've talked about before that Travis Brown thing where he he likes to stop takedowns by throwing like downward elbows. Uh, his, his cardio. The reason why I brought it up earlier about uh, you know the way he fights. I'm not sure about his cardio because I've seen him go 25 minutes on the regional scene, but then I also saw him fading late again, you know, Zach Puaga fight, you know, where he was, you know, which doesn't build a lot of confidence. Now, but you know, I understand what you're saying about Jelton Almeida, but he, they, they fight differently. Like he's very explosive guy, very athletic. He's got some fast hands, good snap on his shots. There's a lot of power shots in, uh, on the feet. I love that he throws hard hooks to the body. Uh, I like that he gets in the pocket. He'll start changing to some slicing elbows, stepping knees, very fast high kick, moves defensively, moves really well. Uh, though he, I, I'm a little worried about his durability. I've seen him get hurt in the past, you know, so far. Like he's he's got a perfect record, but he hasn't been perfect himself. You, you know, and, and, I mean, I don't know if that came out right, but I mean, it, it, it was like the Eagles win today. Like he, he won, but it was like, didn't play great, you know. Uh, <laughs> right now, the Europeans are like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> uh, uh, he's, a, he's a good wrestler. I think he's a better wrestler than I originally thought he was in the UFC. That was one of the ones I was like, ah, I'm not sure about it. But he's, he's looked pretty good. Good top control. Uh, not much of a submission threat. So that's like another thing about, that's different between him and Almeida. Obviously, Almeida is a great submission artist. Uh, though he did get a submission. Uh, Petrino got a submission in his last fight. So um, I just mean he's not like – you know, elite grappler, whatever I've seen so far. Um, I, I like his, his fight against Bellato uh, on the contender series when he, when he gave up his back uh, and Bellato's known for his ground game. He, he stayed very relaxed, found a way to get out of submission. So bad positions, um, he's look, he's, you know, he's look good. I'm a little unsure about his gas tank. It, 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 against T- Anton Tercali, who was a you know, low-level UFC talent, uh, It was he faded at times. But then against Marcin Procmio, he looked much better. So uh, both these guys, I guess, things are question marks to me. As far as prediction, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I'm Bukaxis, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm saying his name wrong, but he, I, I think he might be better than you would think. Like he's, you know, he's a, he's tough out, but I'm not picking him to be, you know, a ranked light heavy one day. I am doing that, Pacino. So I think his pressure, his power, and his wrestling just could be too much. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to say he it goes to decision. I say Pacino wins the decision. Yeah, I I can see where you're coming from on that one, and I agree. The Bukowskis might be better than I thought he was upon his exit from the UFC. Because in hindsight. They did not give that man any breaks. To exit the UFC on the back of losses to Jim Crute, Mihal Oleg Shechuk, and Khalil Roundtree, all three, well, all three, for one, all three of them are good fighters. Yeah. And each of them. Our 20-ish guys. Yeah. And each of them is a stylistic problem for Bukowskis in different ways. Uh, Oleg Shechuk, you know, a guy with a similar general approach and maybe faster hands. Crute and Roundtree, both bigger, stronger guys. And Roundtree in particular, a fellow kickboxer who hits a hell of a lot harder. Uh, even like, all right, side is ready. Like, Roundtree's a terrible wrestler. You yeah. know, uh, even the the best wrestler, still, you know, you say, oh, I'm a terrible size metric for for Khalil Roundtree. Is I'm sure he's still not too excited to sign that contract. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, 
the way he hits and kicks and uh Bukowskis I remember well I don't remember that's why I have notes I went back and looked at my notes uh for when we previewed his fights with Oleg Shechuk and Roundtree and my kind of my top bullet point was he's a guy that wants to kickbox at range but lacks the foot speed and or sorry the footwork and the physical strength to keep guys off him that want to crowd him that has gotten a little better since he's been back but he's only had to prove it against tyson pedro and zach palga so i'm not sure whether that's just sort of meeting in the middle as he's fighting lower level opposition than he did his first time around or he's actually improved because he's gone from like age 25 to 29 he should theoretically just kind of be growing into his full musculature and full power at this point. Uh, he's looked promising against some non-promising fighters. And here, yeah, Petrino should be able to get Bukaskas down with ease. And I think it'll be ugly from there. But even if this stays on the feet, Bukaskas just has a few defensive lapses that I could see him winning rounds on the feet until Petrino catches him with something big that either wins him the round or ends the fight. Uh, and that's kind of where I'm leaning here. I, I think Petrino gets the finish. Uh, give me Petrino by second round TKO, where again, maybe Bukowskis wins the first round, maybe he's looking pretty good in the second. Petrino either shoots an easy takedown or catches him with something on the feet, then hustles him to the ground and pounds him out on the ground. Uh, Petrino by second round TKO. Welterweights take the cage next at UFC Sao Paulo as Eliseu Seleski Dos Santos faces Renat Fakradinov. Zaleski Dos Santos, a 36-year-old Brazilian, is 24-7 and overall. He is 10-3 and since joining the UFC as the former jungle fight welterweight champ. He's on a two-fight win streak. Uh, since his close loss to Muslim Salakov uh, a little over two years ago, he has wins over Benoit saint and Abubakar Nurmagomedov. The most recent of those, the Nurmagomedov fight, was a split decision win after a lengthy time off, almost two full years, back at the Cara France versus Albazi fight night in June. Eliseo Capoeira will look to make it three in a row against Fakradinov. 32-year-old Russian is 21-1 and overall. He is a perfect 3-0 and since joining the UFC out of a variety of Middle Eastern and CIS promotions, uh, but he has wins over Andres Mikhailidis, Brian Battle, and Kevin Lee uh, to his name. The most recent of those, the Lee win, was a 55-second chokeout at uh, UFC on ESPN Strickland versus Magomedov back in July. Fakradinov will look to make it four in a row and attract some attention to himself in a welterweight division where it is typically very difficult to do so and he is heavily favored to get it done uh he is minus 350 eliseo capoeira plus 250 on the comeback keith at least on paper if fakradinov walks through eliseo capoeira it's his best win in the ufc i mean he's looked good but he, oh yeah he got to the ufc off of a brutal win over Rhode Island's second best fighter, Eric Spicely. And then he's taken on Mikhailidis, Battle, and Lee. Of those three, Battle's the only one who really shows signs of life. Uh, I mean, <laughs> he's almost certainly the only one who's still going to be in the UFC a year from now. He might be the only one that's in the UFC now. Uh, will Fakradinov keep rolling against uh, Eliseo Capoeira? Will he make it look easy again? Who wins? Yeah, I mean, a win over Kevin Lee has the biggest name. You know, but um, you're talking like a shell of his former self. You know, seeming like a guy who's who's faded really fast. But who, you know what? Who knows? We've given up on people before, and I mean, I, I always the, the example I always think was Robbie Lawler. You know, where it, it, you know when he left the UFC, it was on that you know pretty bad run outside the UFC. I mean, he wins some suitors on, but just the guy you never ex expect. But I don't think he where, felt where he's having to come back to beat Melvin Manouf at 185 pounds. And yeah, that. he's yeah. brought in he got brought in to lose to Josh Koscheck. So, uh I Oof. I don't know if he's if he went on a run as bad as Kevin Lee is on, but uh, so so this might be historic, but and I know Kevin Lee's already been been released from the UFC, but uh do, Dos Santos, you know, even at this point of his career, is is always going to be a tough out. I mean, and so I I agree. I just want to add to the name value, but yes, like it quality wise, I think it would probably be his best win. Uh, Dos Santos is a good athlete. I mean, he he's a guy who can fight at both stances. He's very aggressive. He's a striker. With I mean, we've we've we broke down Solaska said We know what we got. He's he's a power puncher. Nice snap on his shots. Uh, 
I'd say plus power. He's not, you know, the UFC is going to make him sound like he's Francis and, you know, dropping Tyson Fury, which is, I know I brought up twice. I was fucking crazy that that happened. So good. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he can overthrow his strikes, leave him open for counters. Uh, he throws some spinning attacks, which I'm not crazy about. Throws some flying knees and stuff, and that's due to his couple rest style. Though we have seen a lot less of that as he's aged. Um, also, he's a guy that he he's always kind of relied a little bit on explosions. He's one of these guys. If it if he loses speed in timing at all, he it might all fall apart for him. Um, and a big thing I'm worried about. I'm worried about his chin. I mean, he's he's been in wars, and then he's also you know been hurt in a lot of linemen good. Uh, Li Jing Liang, Muslim Salikov, they all hurt him. Now, he's he can wrestle. I mean, you know, I go back to like the Curtis Millen. Fight. I know that was a long, long time ago, but he, you know, he wrestled them to a victory. So he can do this. I think he's a better offensive wrestler than he is credit. Weaker defensive wrestler. I mean, we've seen him taking down countless times in the UFC. But to his credit, he should really improve takedown defense against Abubakar and Namagamadov. Namagamadov couldn't really get him down. So, uh, Fakhradinov, action fighter. Very aggressive. He wants to get in the pocket, and he wants to throw bombs. I mean, he throw he wings hard, looping shots, but he's got power for days. I mean, he's got eleven knockouts. His check left hook is his best strike. Uh, I also love that he rips the body. Uh, he strikes a little bit like Fedor used to strike. And again, I always want to throw this warning out before anybody gets at me. I'm not clear calling him Fedor, but uh, good wrestler, fast entries. He he's a submission threat. He's got six submission wins. I mean, he sub Kevin Lee wicked fast. So. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a fun scrap. I mean, it's going to be action packed, you know. It, it, but to me, it feels like a passing of the torch fight. Uh, Dos Santos has been in so many wars. Uh, I love the guy. I really. I mean, how can you not? I mean, he, he's in that. You know, we think about action guys. You know, in the UFC, those they tear down. Not the highest guys. Not your Justin Gaethje's, your Robbie Lawless, but the guys that are the next tier down. The guys who they're not winning UFC titles, but they're just so well, fun, dude, violent guys. Put He's him alongside action. like Santiago Ponzinibbio, that was kind of on a long streak at the same time he was in the late 2010s. Yeah, Ponzinibbio. Uh, I was thinking of Vicente Luque. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just these guys that you just you watch them and you just gotta love them, you know, because they they're gonna be entertaining that shelf life is short though. And he might've already kind of wore out, you know, wore out where I was welcome. You know, it's like, it's like when I, uh, you know, my, my wife be like, Oh, when's the expiration day? And I go downstairs and look at my fire extinguisher. I was like, uh, 10 years ago, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm sure you pull the pen out and squeeze it. It still works. But, uh, fuck, fuck has power. I, I say we got a war, but fuck you know, I think he, he gets that big moment. I think he finishes him with a big shot. I say he does in the very first round. He can be fucking you know, by first round TKO. I love this fight for all the reasons you mentioned. Uh, if you don't like Eliseo Capoeira, I don't know what you're doing watching. Well, I don't know what you're doing watching the UFC, much less watching our show. Uh, Cause we're here <laughs> to talk about like the deep mid card guys that are awesome. And <laughs> you think it's someone who, you think it's someone who searched, uh, you know, on YouTube, uh, never ending story that we, we popped up. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be, that, they're going to be disappointed. That, that's that, that one dislike that we get on every video. Yeah. Fuck uh, you. <laughs> fuck that guy who always doing that one dislike. I like to think that it's the same guy that there's just, cause yeah, there's not I, two like, people. There's not two people who don't like our show. Right. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, by the way, hey, you brought up likes. Hey, I, a lot of people liked our last show after I, I had to pay. Do it again, guys. Hit the like button. Yeah, we we appreciate it. It uh, helps us out with the algorithm and all that stuff that all the it, people else asked you guys to do. So It, it costs you nothing. Or if you hate us, hit the dislike. It's still yeah. engagement. And you know what? No, like, don't do that. <laughs> peek, peek behind the curtain. Uh, you know, I, I see the the numbers. We're, we're always sitting at like 96.8 positive, you know, 97% positive. Uh, cause there's always just like one or two people that, that click the dislike and yeah, that's almost better. If it was a hundred percent liked, I'd be like, what's going on here? So, okay. you know, like, thanks to the <laughs> one just put a challenge control. out there. Now we're going to get a bunch of freaking people, <laughs> you know, yeah, don't, don't punish me for that. Maybe, maybe the right. never ending two uh, fan club is going to come out of the rest. You know, how great well, of a movie that one was there. That's one more dislike. <laughs> the one person that sat through that piece of shit. Anyway, uh, for a guy named Capoeira, 
there is surprisingly little capoeira silliness going on. Like he, he does like his flashy stuff, but your handstand spinning butterfly kick type stuff, you, you don't get a whole lot of. I'm with you in that the thing I'm most concerned about as he, you know, he's going to turn 37 a few days after this show, uh, after, after this event, is the chin. Because everything else seems fine. Like his cardio seems fine. He seems as fast and powerful as he's ever been. He doesn't seem to have aged that badly that way. But I agree with you about the chin. And it's hard to spot coming because we're talking about someone who's going on 30 career fights and has only been knocked out once. But if you look past the numbers and you look at his actual fights, he's gotten rung up win or lose in a lot of his fights recently. And it's cost him. Go Look no further than the Li Jingliang fight. He had won seven fights in a row going into that, kind of very slowly making his way up the welterweight ladder, entering that Ponzinibbio, Luke uh, type, you know, action fighter who's also a very good fighter type mold. They book him against Li Jingliang in China. Winner of that fight is a top 10 welterweight and finally on the radar. And it was anybody's fight with 15 seconds to go. They had each won one round. It was anybody's round. And Lee caught him with one punch that lamped him and the thing was over. Uh, that's the kind of thing that doesn't get better with the passage of four years. And that's how long it's been since then. And with someone who is as aggressive and hits as hard as Fakradinov, that's a risky thing. And then the other thing about Fakradinov is, he has one thing going for him that Fedor did not at age 32. Fakhardinov prefers to strike and knock you out, but when he is faced with another good striker, he's willing to turn to his wrestling. He beat Brian Battle by taking him down a lot, pretty easily. Um, like that was a big part of his win over Battle. He took him down a bunch in the first round. It changed how Battle approached the rest of the fight. If he decides to do that to Eliseo Capoeira, I think that plays well into his hands as well. I mean, he could knock out Eliseo in the first round, like that's your pick. And I'm not going to be shocked at all if that happens, but if he plays it just a little more conservatively uh, and goes for an opportunistic takedown, or at least a takedown attempt that gives uh, Dos Santos something to think about. I think that reduces the chance that he ends up on the wrong end of a highlight reel knockout sometime in the remaining 12 minutes of the fight. Uh, but I'm with you here. Uh, Dos Santos chin being what it is or isn't anymore and with Vakardinov throwing the kind of volume and power that he does, I think he finds that chin at some point. Uh, I'm going to go with Vakardinov by second round TKO here, but I think it's going to be, it might not win fight of the night, but it'll probably deserve it. Bantam weights are up next as Victor Hugo Silva takes on Daniel Marcos. Silva, the 30 year old Brazilian is 24 and four overall. This will be his uh, UFC debut. He is the other of the two fighters on this card who competed on this season of The Ultimate Fighter. He fought in just back in October, knee barring uh, Eduardo Torres in the second round. He'll get in against the undefeated and streaking uh, Marcos. Uh, Marcos, 30-year-old Peruvian, is a perfect 15-0 as a professional. He's a perfect 2-0 since joining the UFC out of last season of Dana White's Contender Series. He has back-to-back -back wins over Simon Oliveira and Davy Grant. The most recent of those, the Grant fight, was at the Aspinall versus Tybura card back in July. That was the, uh, the London card. He will look to make it three in a row, keep his undefeated record, and continue to make noise in the men's bantamweight division, and he is favored to do so. In fact, I believe he is the biggest favorite on the card in terms of being favored over a Brazilian, as Marcos is minus 250 or so, uh, Victor Hugo around plus 190 on the comeback. Uh, Keith, hard to, I, I, I'm not committing you to anything because we're talking about the men's bantamweight division here. <laughs> these, these are shark infested waters, yeah. but to what extent do you believe in Daniel Marcos as a, even a potential like top 15 guy in the future? And tell me if you think he gets past Victor Hugo on Saturday. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good. Um, I, yeah, it's just it, that division. I mean, I, I know it's, it's such a cop out, but to to make a run in that division is like i mean i think it's the best division in all of mma um especially when you in you know you, you take in other organizations fighters too 
Uh, I mean, he's good. I mean, he's a very good striker. He's a pressure striker. He marches down his foe. He'd be coming off a big win. Uh, you know, I know it was controversial, but a big win. Uh, he fights at a controlled pressure. You know, it's not. You know, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, balls to the wall, but it's, it's yeah, like we said, very, like we talked about Alex Volkanovsky, like he's cruising on the highway, <laughs> you know, um, he's technically sound with a, you know, fights behind a high guy defense. He's a quick hands, keeps everything short and tight inside. Uh, very accurate. Uh, he sees his shots and he lands well. Uh, he threw, I, I said this before, I like that he throws the spots and he catches opponents trying to escape. He's very intelligent that way. Uh, just touches until there's an opening. He has some pop. I love that he rips the body. He's not much of an offensive wrestler, but he did take Davy Grant out to his credit. Uh, but he's a weak defensive wrestler, and that's a big issue. Victor Hugo, I mean, the one thing I like about this guy coming into the UFC, and, and he's a guy that, you know, we talked about earlier is, you know, whether a guy is a UFC talent or not. Uh, I, I feel yes for this guy. You know, like he's he's done enough on the regional scene. Um, he's just – he's got so much experience for, for you know, a guy – uh, you know, making his UFC debut. Uh, he, you know, he's, I'd say he's, you know, fairly well-rounded, you know, there's nothing really jumps out at me about him, but, but it also goes the other way where it, there's, there's not much I, I hate about the guy, uh, you know, on the feet, he's very aggressive. He's, he's definite Marcos in the sense where it, it, it's a, it's a brawler. Like he throws a lot of wild power shots. I'd say he's got plus power. He likes some spinning attacks. He throws a lot of kicks, but he'll often throw them without a setup, which could be an issue. Uh, he will look for takedowns, but he's he's not a wrestler. He's more of a jujitsu guy. Uh, but if he gets on top, he's got some pretty strong top game. He's got nine submission wins. You gotta like that. He likes lower body attacks. I mean, we he, uh, what I mean by like you know going off the legs and below. He he got a knee bar in the contender series. He kind of fell right into it. it. Wasn't like he set it up, but just the way his scramble happened. Uh, but he also almost got a calf slicer too in that same match, which I like. Uh, so as the prediction goes, Marcos has the advantage on the feet. Hugo probably has the advantage on the ground. Uh, you said the line was – what was it? Marcos is minus 250. Yeah, I think it should be closer to that, you, you know. And, and I and I like Marcos. I just I, – I think Hugo – because it's an avenue for victory for Hugo. Uh, if Hugo can get the fight down, you know, between his submissions or just being the better wrestler, like, he, you know, he can have a lot of success on the ground. Uh, that says I like Marcos stand-up. Uh, I think he does enough on the feet where he's throwing straight shots down the pipe beating Hugo to the point of contact because Hugo's throwing bombs. Uh, if Hugo's style because he's so aggressive with his grappling and so aggressive with his hands, if he fades a little bit, I really think Marcos, you know, who's, who's a little bit of a builder can really take over. So I'd say Marcos does. i say Marcos wins by decision. Yeah, I. both of these guys offer a few surprises from what your at first glance uh, scouting report would be on them. And you kind of alluded to that a little bit just in, in talking about them. But Marcos, I mean... Matt Hughes once very famously said, if you haven't lost in this uh, sport, you just haven't faced the, the right guy yet. And I feel that's the case for Marcos. And I'm not saying he's bad. Cause I <laughs> tell it to Habib and John Jones. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, uh, you know, uh, Habib absolutely retired before he fought the right guy. Uh, yeah, that's true. But um, <laughs> I don't know if that right guy was ever coming though. That's <laughs> that, that's entirely possible. But, the, um, he he might've been finding the right guy every single day in the gym. Yeah. That's a good point, too. But, you know, Marcos, sometimes when a prospect comes to the UFC undefeated with more than 10 wins, like not 5-0, and but when they come to the UFC 12-0, and 14-0, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. You know, you're kind of uh... – well, hell, even like someone like Mohamed Mokayev, where they're, they're young and they're dazzling. You know, Marcos, there's not that. There's, there's a sense that – yeah, I think he's good, but he may just not have fought the right guy yet. He came up fighting pretty low-level people, even if, you know, 300 Sparta, despite its really embarrassing name, is Peru's best uh, promotion. He didn't fight a great guy in the Contender Series. Simon Oliveira wasn't great, and the win over Davy Grant was kind of iffy. There's possibility that Marcos hangs around the UFC for a long time, but he's not going to stay undefeated. Uh, with... Victor Hugo, it's kind of funny. The guy's nickname is Striker, and he has substantially more submission wins than KO wins at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. And 
And, but it's a story of two careers because for his <laughs> one, first one punch picket, <laughs> Brad, one punch picket. <laughs> <laughs> but at one point it was fair to call him that in his first 10 fights, you know, he won six of them by knockout. I think it's more recently that he's become uh, more reliant on his grappling. I think his only knockout win quote unquote in the last half of his career was due to injury. Uh, <clears throat> which just points to what you said. He's a well-rounded fighter, no obvious weaknesses. Uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of tape uh, out there on him. Uh, a good number of his fights, because he is an Aspera fight team guy, a good number of his fights took place in Aspera FC. But unlike the stereotypical inflated Aspera FC prospect, he also fought in other promotions throughout. So he, he's been tested against a variety of different levels uh, of competition. Here, I... I think once they get in the cage, he's going to come across as smaller than Marcos and giving up range. That makes me worry about how, quote, striker will look in the striking. I think you're right that Marcos is going to have the advantage there. But I think this fight's going to end up on the ground. Uh, e even Marcos is kind of measured aggression. I think there are going to be opportunities for Silva to just get inside on him initiate clinches, maybe push into the fence, get it on his hips, haul him down. And I think his advantages there are going to be substantial. Uh, I'm going to go with I, what I guess is a fairly substantial upset here, but give me Silva to win two rounds out of three by getting Marcos down, keeping him down and putting him in peril, either landing enough ground and pound to win rounds or actually taking dominant positions and, and threatening with submissions. Uh, I think this goes the distance, but uh, give me Silva in, uh, in an upset. Next up at UFC Sao Paulo, and at least as the card is currently constituted, the top prelim is a lightweight attraction between Elvis Brenner and Esteban Ribovics. Brenner, the 26-year-old Brazilian and product of Team Shootabox Diego Lima. If you're looking at his picture beneath our faces right now and saying, oh, he's not from Shootabox Diego Lima, no, he does have bleach blonde hair now. We just need to update his photo. Uh, he's 15-3 and three overall. He's 2-0 and oh in the UFC. Debuted earlier this year with a split decision win over Zabira Takugov. Came back in July with a third-round knockout of Garam Kutadaladze that kind of established him as a new person of interest in the 155-pound division. He'll try to keep that momentum going against Rebovics. The 27-year-old Argentinian is 12-1 and one overall. He's one and one since joining the UFC out of season six of Dana White's Contender Series. His first and thus far only career loss took place in his UFC debut back in March at UFC 285, where he dropped a unanimous decision to Loic Rajabov, came back and redeemed himself at UFC 290 in July with a unanimous decision win over Camuela Kirk. Uh, he'll look to continue his resurgence against Brenner. He's not favored to get it done, but the line is pretty close. Brenner is minus 150, Rubivix plus 120. Keith, uh, these are two of the more kind of promising young guys in this division. All we know about Elvis Brenner, or sorry, all we know about Esteban Rubivix is that he's better than Cam Kirk and he's worse than Louis Grajabov. There's a lot of space in between there. And then uh, Brenner, again, kind of opened people's eyes with that uh, win over Guram Katadaladze. Who gets it done here? And again, not committing you to anything, but uh, <laughs> hey, do you see top 15 upside for either of these guys in what is still a hard ass division? To do that? Yeah, that's always the, yeah, I don't, I don't know. But the, the winner is definitely going to take a big step in that right direction because I think, I think it's be a real good quality win is, as you said, I like both guys, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I know I just killed his name, but Esteban will call it. Yeah. He's a, he's a, very good athlete. He fights out of both stances, high volume, good boxing, tight boxing, not much tells, works behind a crisp jab, attacks with combos, uh, throws a lot of power shots, uh, and can be can be a little um, I don't want to say wild, but a little reckless where you know he'll 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 you know, try to knock the, the opponent's head off and kind of leave him to be open to be countered. Um, you go back to like the contender series fight. He was getting tagged a little bit in that, but he looked way better in his de debut controlled does have good power. Uh, he loves close and distance with flying knees, not a great wrestler. Yeah. Uh, his, his takedown defense is, is kind of weak, 
but he's more of a BJJ artist. I mean, he's pretty good at scrambling. Uh, he can catch a submission. He loves going for Kamaras. He hits Kamaras in like every position. Uh, some of it just to kind of get a scramble to continue. Uh, he improved his ability to get off the bottom against uh, Kemuela Kirk as the fight went on, which I like that. And he's got good cardio to go hard, you know, all 15 minutes. Elvis Brenner, uh, big guy for the weight class, uh, not the best athlete, a little flat-footed, but he showed insane toughness against like um, – Garam Kutalatse, where he was eating shots and just kept moving forward, marching him down, and eventually folded him. Uh, serviceable striker, I'd say. Attacks with combinations. Uh, he he also loves flying attacks, so he's, he'll, he'll go airborne to you know close the distance. Plus power, uh, fights behind a high guard defense. Has some defensive holes, like he keeps his chin a little too high in the air for me. Uh, pulls his head straight back. Uh, he also doesn't you know, move side to side, so he's he's one of these guys. He's going to eat a shot to land one. He can wrestle. Uh, I like that he uses his size to get upper body takedowns, show some good takedown advance uh, against Sabara Tukagov and Kutalatse. Yeah, he gets in a lot of scrambles, and he has this very funk-style wrestling game where uh, you know, he wins a lot of those scrambles. On top, hard ground and pound. He's a serious submission threat. He's got 11 subs in his record. Uh, he's, he gets submissions off his back, uh, though he does struggle to get back up. But I like that he has good cardio. Uh, I like this fight. I think it's a really good fight. I'm going to go with Brenner due to having the wrestling advantage. Um, and Rivers would go for subs instead of trying to stuff takedowns, which I think you go to Brenner's advantage. Give me Brenner to win by uh, – for a guy who I wasn't that high coming to the UFC, I think he's going to get another big victory. So give me Brenner by decision. Yeah, I, I'm with you on on most points here. For For me, I just – I don't know if two years from now – Elvis Brenner is going to be a top 10 guy still just 28 years old and one of the hottest prospects in the division, or we're going to see him as just another guy or even a washout who had five seconds of incredible work against Graham Katataladze because he was getting to put on him for 13 minutes and change caught Graham Katataladze with one fantastic left, uh, you know, kind of like right on the ear that short circuited, a very, very good fighter. Uh, but even if he had, even if he hadn't landed that one punch and had just lost a straightforward 30, 27 decision, I'd still be kind of high on him as a prospect. Uh, you know, these guys being just 26 and 27 years old uh, is, is a nice thing for this division. And I'm with you. Uh, Brenner's probably going to have an advantage in physical strength. He's almost certainly going to have an advantage in the matchup of offensive versus defensive wrestling. And then Ribovic's tendency to make that worse by, you know, defending with the guillotine, uh, you know, or conceding the takedown and going to guard and starting to work offense off his back, I think is going to play right into Brenner's hands. Brenner's just too good a grappler to lose a fight with a guy who's going to concede takedowns. So give me Brenner by uh, decision as well, but I expect this will be a fun fight. And I suspect that these are guys that are going to be around this division for quite a while to come. And one or both of them might make some noise. Keith, we are back for the main card of UFC Fight Night 231, Almeida versus Lewis. We lost five or six fighters to injury off of this card in the weeks leading up to the bout. And none of them was Vince Pichel. <laughs> yeah, what a time crazy. of miracles we live in. <laughs> yeah. The six fight main card of UFC Sao Paulo opens up with a lightweight matchup between Ismael Bonfim, one of two Bonfim brothers on this card, and the veteran Pichel. Bonfim, 27-year-old Brazilian, is 19-4 and four overall. He's 1-1 one and one since joining the UFC out of the 2022 season of Dana White's Contender Series. He debuted with a sensational win, second round knockout of Terrence McKinney back in January came back in July and got tapped out in the first round with an extremely uncomfortable looking face crank by Benoit saint -Denis. So he'll be looking to get back on track. He had what I think was a 12 or 13 fight win streak snapped uh, in July. So he's looking to start a new one against Pichel. Pichel, the 40 year old from Southern California by way of Englewood, Colorado. He's 14 and three overall, just the fact that Ismael Bonfim is 13 years younger and has a lot more fights tells you a lot of what you need to know about Vince Pichel. <laughs> anyway, yeah. he's 14 and three overall 
he's seven and three since joining the UFC out of the 15th season of the ultimate fighter. He was on tough 15 and he only has 10 fights in the UFC. I'm not saying that tough 15 was a long time ago, but he's one of, I think only two alums of that season left in the UFC alongside Michael Chiesa, who barely is. He's at the desk far more often than he's in the cage. I mean, this is the season that gave us James Vick, Ally Aquinta, Miles Jury, Good season. Oh, no, no, here, here, here's how long ago Tough 15 was. Cristiano Marcelo was on that season. Yeah. He is the coach of Vitor Petrino and Eliseo Zaleski Dos Santos. And Eliseo Zaleski Dos Santos is almost 37 years old. Yeah. That's how long ago <laughs> Tough fucking 15 was. You named, the, uh, you named the guys. That was a good season. You know, no, going by talent wise. Yeah, talent wise. Good season, talent wise. It's had a, multiple title contenders, title challengers. Uh, but Pichel, obviously, He's been very good when he's in the cage. He's seven and three in the UFC with some actual quality wins over quality fighters, but his is a story of injuries, repeated injuries. And I'm just going to quote myself from the article I wrote about that season a couple of years ago. Unlike some fighters who struggle with repeated injuries to one body part, Fedor's hands, Shogun's knees, Pichel visits the hospital like a man trying to finish a bingo card. Shoulder surgery, check. Bicep surgery, check. Hip surgery, check. A hit and run accident on his motorcycle that stripped half the skin off his back, bingo. Uh, Vince Pichel never met an ER that he didn't want to go into and visit. And it's a shame because again, coming out of that season and at his best and at the time of his best wins, he looked like a potential top 10 guy, but just multiple layoffs of over a year. He's fought once a year, every year since 2018, just with injuries in between, getting older, getting older, still shows signs of life when he, when he gets out there and and fights. But yeah, just those are those are fast moving waters. If you fight once a year, even if you win every single time, you're just never going to get any traction. Uh, he's coming in off a loss. He fought uh, back in April, dropping a unanimous decision to Mark O. Madsen. This will be the first. Okay, knock on wood. Well, knock on glass in the case of my desk. Uh, if he makes it to the cage on Saturday, this will be the first time he's fought twice in a calendar year since 2018. Uh, needless to say, he is not favored to get it done against the red hot Bonfim. Uh, Bonfim is minus 480, is about the best you can find on him. Pichel out there around plus 360 or so. Uh, Keith, it, to what extent are you high on Bonfim as a 155 pound prospect? And how much convinced Pichel teaches about him? Yeah, I'm not high, as high on him as I am his brother, but I'm still pretty high on him. Um, <laughs> Vince Pichel, on the other hand, you know, the guy is so inactive. I, I forget that he exists at time. You know, like when they when I'm going through, you know, I, I, I think I've said this before. I always write down all the names of the fighters and who I want to kind of preview first and to kind of rank them. You know, obviously the guy's making the de debut. I'm going to check out them first and then kind of work from there. <laughs> when I wrote down Vince Pichel, I was like, oh, my God, he's still on the roster. Like, I, I – I kind of forgot him. You said that he, you know, he, all these injuries, he's always visiting hospitals. Plus, the way he fights, he's going to go to the hospital too if he actually does make it to the yeah. to the cage. Uh, he's, you know, he's not a great athlete. He's very flat-footed, but I mean, the dude's tough. I mean, when he when he gets in there, he's high output, just marches down his opponents with, you know, throwing strikes. Not the fastest of hands, uh, but he'll set up his stuff well with 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 feints. Um, Willing to eat a shot to land some of his own because he trusts his chin. Uh, good kicking game, especially to the legs. Uh, he uses, you know, he's got very physically strong guy. He'll get in the clinch and use his strength in there. Uh, he'll drop down on the legs and look for a takedown. He, he, one note I wrote of him a while ago, he's a better wrestler than I credit him with. Like he's, and then I remember him. I mean, and if you take him down, he's hard to hold down. Now, Bonfim, he's the opposite. He's this great athlete. He's a Muay Thai style striker, a counter striker. He sees strikes coming at him, and, and he counters well. Uh, he's good at beating his opponent to the point of contact. Very accurate. You go back to his UFC win against Terrence McKinney. I mean, he looked incredible in that fight. Works behind a crisp jab. Works the body. I love his left hook to the body. Uh, he sits on his punches, so he draws pretty good power. Uh, he'll wing his power shots at his opponent. I, I shouldn't say wing. That sounds like bad. Like, who just whips it. He just, he's got a good snap on his shots. Uh, he does well to wrap his shots around his opponent's punches, which I like. Uh, I love that he 
that he you know throws really hard kicks and, and also goes down to the body. Uh, incredible flying knee knockout on Terrence McKinney also. Uh, defensively, he's got some issues. Pillars um, will back straight up. Uh, good ground fighter. Uh, he can wrestle. He's got some good entries. Uh, physically strong. If you get a limb, he can slam his opponent. Um, definitely more BJ style than, than you know, a, a traditional wrestler. He's got forced submission of wins, but as you saw in his last fight, he's not flawless on the ground. So, Brissell is tough. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, you know, he's 40 years old and with a slew of injuries, it's hard to have any confidence in him. And, and Bonfin, I still think, has, even though despite having a setback, he looks like he could be a future contender. I, I say he styles on Bichelle. Bichelle is smart. He's got that, like, Gerald Murashaw thing where he's going to put himself in the best chance of winning. Uh, I just think the level of athleticism is too much. I think eventually, you know, all those wars and injuries and age and everything, you know, it's going to have finally catch up to him. And I think Bonfin's the guy who's going to do it to him. Give me Bonfin to knock him out in the second round. I love that you made the Gerald Mearshart comparison because what I was going to lead with is that Vince Pichel is what it looks like when you give somebody uh, Darren Elkins' approach to fighting without the physical durability to make it work. Uh, but uh, Mearshart is, an, is a, another good example where Mearshart knows his best routes to victory, knows that against faster, more explosive fighters, he's probably going to have to take a little punishment and wait for his spot or wait for a guy to get tired. And for the most part, he's been able to make it work. Pichel can't. Um, I thought he was a decent athlete 12 years ago when he was on tough. That's faded. And like, again, a five. He was a five. And that's only faded, as he said, the laundry list of injuries I mentioned, plus just, well, being 40 years old, 41 in a couple weeks. He's, he's not, you know, barely 40. He's almost 41. 41 is old in any division other than heavyweight, but at lightweight, it's it's something. There have been a few guys that have had surprising success, you know, at or past age 40 in this division, but not many. And Pichel would not be your choice of candidate for it, considering how much wear he's got. I agree with you that um, his wrestling is surprisingly good. I mean, he can be exploited by an elite wrestler. His three losses in the UFC to Rustam Habilov, Gregor Gillespie, and Marco Madsen. I mean, those are three of the, definitely two of the more decorated wrestlers and three of the better overall wrestlers that have passed through the, the division in, in his time. But against other guys that are pretty good wrestlers, your Jim Miller types, he's been more than fine. But you went right to the heart of it at the end there. His approach to the fight, the only thing that gives him whatever chance of victory he has against most opponents is going to be poison against Bonfim. Marching forward and throwing good volume against someone that's going to have such a speed and power advantage in Bonfim it's going to be like walking into a wood chipper. I don't know if he makes it to the second round, but if he makes it to the second round, he's going to look like he's been hit by another car on his motorcycle. Uh, just, yeah, bad matchup. And Bonfim is the kind of guy that if he wants to try and surprise Pichel as Pichel plods forward, I think he could get an easy reactive takedown just because he's so much faster. He could be on Pichel's hips and kind of dumping him on, on the map before he knows it. Uh, you said Bonfim styles on him. I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good summation of it. I don't remember what round you said, but I'm going with Bonfim by uh, second round TKO that probably gets finished on the ground. The main card of UFC Fight Night 231 powers on with a 185-pound matchup between Rodolfo Vieira and Armin Petrosian. Vieira, the 34-year-old Brazilian, is 9-2 as a professional mixed martial artist. He is 4-2 in the UFC. He won his last time out, uh, Tapped out Cody Brundage early in the second round back in April at UFC on ESPN Song versus Simone. That allowed him to bounce back from a frankly frustrating looking decision loss to Chris Curtis last summer. He will look to make it two in a row and maximize his uh, remaining athletic prime against Petrosian. Uh, Petrosian, the 32 year old Armenian by way of Russia, by way of, uh, I can't remember where he trains now. Anyway, uh, nine and two overall as well. 3-1 and one since joining the UFC out of the fifth season of Dana White's Contender Series. He is on a two-fight win streak uh, since his last loss, which was to 
Kyle Bahalio, who appears later on this card. He has back-to-back -back wins over AJ Dobson and Christian Leroy Duncan. The most recent of those, the Duncan win, was at the Vittori versus Cannoneer fight night back in June. Of all the fights on this card, this is the only pick -em. Both gentlemen out there at minus 110 or so, uh, depending on which book you look for. Keith, this is about as pure a uh, stylistic, old school style versus style matchup as you're going to find on this card. I know who won most of the style versus style matchups in your single digit uh, UFCs, but yeah. uh, UFC Fight yeah. Night 231, who gets it done and how? Yeah, um, man. Well, yeah, it's definitely style versus style fight, obviously. Um, but it's funny because we think of a guy like Hadolfo Vera as is a grappler, and obviously so. But if he was in this in the early UFCs, he'd be one of the best strikers in the UFC. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he'd be like he'd be like freaking uh, Marco Huas or something. Uh, you know, he, he's, dude, he's dude, now he's, I want him to go out there in a pair of wrestling shoes and like red nose shorts, like a little <laughs> booty shorts. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, he's a better striker than he gets credit for because he's he's such a great athlete. Um, I like his straight right. He hits super hard. Uh, he lands because his opponents are worried about his takedowns, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, he lacks head movement, so he eats a lot of shots. Uh, but he can take some shots, and he's a lot tougher than than he gets credited for. I mean. It, not many people can eat the shots he did against Chris Curtis and, and continue to come. Um, earlier fights in the UFC, Anthony Hernandez, uh, Safarov, Saperbeck, Safarov, all landed some hard shots on him. Uh, he he is a strong wrestler. I mean, for a guy who's such a decorated grappler, I, I've described him before as a like a Hikado Arona in that sense, where uh, he's a top side grappler. He's got some good entries. Uh, though he sometimes he doesn't he doesn't set up his entries with strikes he'll shoot blindly um, and and kind of drive he can drive through your hips he's explosive in that sense uh, but he doesn't chain wrestle as well as and doesn't cut the corners as well because he's still you know a BJJ grappler not your traditional you know American wrestler uh, he's very physically strong you see him uh, obviously he's a wizard on the ground I mean. You go to his Wikipedia page, and I mean, just the credentials just keeps going. All the awards and the high level, uh, you know, competition. We, we've read it before. I'm not going to read him again. Uh, he, but he's but it's not an exaggeration to call him maybe the best grappler that's transitioned to MMA this close to his athletic prime. Like he's a, he's he's yeah. in the team photo. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 one of the greatest grapplers in the history of of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Never mind, you know, uh, MMA. Uh, but one issue I have is because he's so explosive, he carries so much muscle. He has that like Phil Baroni effect on him, where he he gassed out and you know he looks so you know he's taking pictures on the beach. He looks good, but uh, because of that, as Joe Rogan always likes to say, you know, you carry all that money, you got to carry that oxygen with it. Uh, he's gassed out in fights. Matrosian is a really good striker. Uh, he moves well. He's elusive. Good footwork. Uh, it's funny I've said this before about him, which is surprising for guys good striker. He actually circles to his opponent's power, which is very surprising. Um, but they were pointing that out, and I know I'm bringing it up for like the third time. <laughs> yeah, they were talking about uh, Tyson Fury actually does the same thing apparently. So uh, he's 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 got some fast hands. He he throws straight shots down the pipe. He's got really good power. I mean, he's got five knockouts. Incredible kicking game. Throws a lot of kicks. Kicks to the body. Kicks to the calves. Got a crushing high kick. Uh, he's not bad clinch fighter. His offer, also offensive wrestling just doesn't exist, and it's, he's a very weak defensive wrestler. He's been taken down countless times in the UFC, uh, and, but he's hard to hold down, and he's got good cardio. You know that he can work hard all fifteen minutes. I feel like this fight is is easy and hard to pick. It's easy because you there are really, in my opinion. Two likely options. Now there's a bunch of options that could happen, but two likely options. The first is either Vera just takes him down, subs him quick. I mean, we we seen him get taken down by lesser wrestlers, and he just and, and you know you get taken down by Vera. Good luck, and you know that could happen. He can just get taken down and is quickly subbed, or Petrosian survives the early attack and picks him apart as Vera fades. Now Vera shoots him for takedowns. He can't get him down. He's, you know, the take, stuff that takes us becomes easy and easier. He starts getting his legs kicked out on. He's eating punches. The 
the reason why it's hard to pick, it, it's hard to figure out which one is actually going to happen. Uh, you, I love that you mentioned like the early UFCs because the other UFCs I would just laugh at this and go, "Oh, Vera's gonna take him down and, and submit him." And a part of me is saying, "Like, dude, what are you doing? Like, pick that. That's the most likely thing that's gonna happen." And, and I, I think he's gonna get him down. I, in, in, I think he's gonna dominate him early. But I'm gonna say somehow Petrosian survives, and then he gets it back to the feet, and then he kicks the legs, and he stops some takedowns, and gets taken down again, and he somehow. You know, over time, he makes it harder and harder. And then I think he finally catches him. I think he, Vieira starts to slow down gas. And I think, uh, I think Petrosian is going to start him with something. So uh, I think it's going to be like, you know, kick his legs and then goes with a high kick or something like that. I'm going to say Petrosian does it. I'm going to say late in the first round. Give me Petrosian by first round TKO. All right. Uh, I, I love the, the breakdown there. And obviously, the sport has advanced enormously in the 30 years since the fights you and I are thinking of. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, fighters like Vieira and Petrosian have been you know, lifted with that tide. Petrosian has defended a takedown before. He at least knows what Vieira's techniques are, are called, even if, you know, whether or not he's able to defend them. It's not like Hoyce Gracie tapping people out with something they can't even spell. Uh, but... <clears throat> At the heart of it, yeah, it's still the basic arms race that has informed this sport since the beginning. And it's always fun when we get one of those old school matchups on, uh, uh, you know, on on one of these cards. Uh, hell, dude, you and I are old school Sherdog sure Radio Network listeners and callers from way back in the day. First time I ever really called in and talked to, you know, TJ DeSantis and Jordan Bream was back in, I guess it was 09 when Frank Mir fought Shet Congo which was, you know, a classic example of that yeah. type of, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, where I said, you know, th this is the most obvious two true outcomes fight, both of which end in the first round, you know, that I, I, I can think of. But here, Vieira has made small incremental progress in a way that's, in something that not a lot of fighters improve in, because you and I, of course, we previewed and recapped his fight against Anthony Hernandez. There's a difference between getting tired and gassing out to the point where you are no longer functional. Uh, lots of fighters get tired. Almost every fighter gets tired. There are a few that never seem to break a sweat no matter what. I think I've never seen Demetrius Johnson tired. But we're about to preview a Derek Lewis fight. It's possible to breathe with your mouth wide open and yeah. still be trying to win the fight and still keeping a few you know, apples in your bag to, you know, to throw it at the guy's head. Vieira, and I don't want to take too much away from Anthony Hernandez because he's one of our guys. We both love Anthony Hernandez, and that was such a, yeah. a great win for him. But there's a chance that the more measured Rodolfo Vieira that we've seen in the last year or year and a half doesn't gas out that badly, doesn't, doesn't push himself too hard looking for the round one submission that he thinks everyone is expecting out of him. And just goes ahead and just wins that first round, maybe ten to eight, maybe maybe not even ten to eight, but leaves enough in the gas tank. Because what I've seen out of him in his last uh, couple of fights is, all of a sudden, he has enough uh, gas to function in the second and third round of a fight that he's winning, or even in a fight that he's losing. He had to be incredibly frustrated against Chris Curtis, one of the smallest guys in that division, and I don't know what his final takedown percentage was, but it was not good. And meanwhile, Curtis is just cutting angles on him, you know, cutting him up on, on the feet. And Vieta was tired in the third round. He was more tired than Curtis, but he wasn't non-functional. His arms weren't just hanging limply at his side, at his sides, you know? Uh, that gives me hope that if this thing goes past the first round, Vieta is still in it. Uh, I could see Petrosian, knocking out Vieira. He is a, a good striker with good power. I love that you mentioned the circling thing. Uh, to me, of course, always the classic go-to example of a fighter who circled the quote-unquote wrong way would be Mirko Krokop. He knowingly circled towards his opponent's power because he trusted his speed and reflexes and liked that it made his left high kick come from more of a blind angle to his opponent, and it worked and worked and worked until it didn't. Uh, for Petrosian, so far it's been working pretty well. But here, 
the crux of the matchup to me is still that Vieira's takedowns are surprisingly good for a BJJ guy, and Petrosian's defense is not particularly good even for a converted kickboxer at this point. I think Vieira gets Petrosian down. I wouldn't be too surprised if Vieira taps him out in the first round just with one of his muscle man topside arm triangles. But if he doesn't get it in the first round, I'm now confident that he'll be able to try again in the second, which is what makes me feel better about picking him in this righteous pick and fight. Give me Vieira by second round submission. But uh, I can't wait to see what happens here. This is a, this is a fun kind of old school style versus style matchup. Next up on the UFC Sao Paulo main card is another middleweight matchup. This time it is Caio Bahalio looking to improve on his still perfect UFC record against late notice replacement Abus Magomedov. Bahalio, the 30 year old Brazilian, is 14 and 1 with one no contest. Overall, he is 4 and 0 since joining the UFC out of season five of Dana White's Contender Series, where they made him fight twice three weeks apart. He won both times, uh, beating Aaron Jeffrey the first time, uh, Jesse Murray the second. Since he's been in the UFC, he has four straight wins over Gaji, Omar Gajiev, Petrosian, whom we just talked about, Mahmoud Muradov, and most recently, back in April, at the Song versus Simone fight night card, Mihal Oleksiejczyk, whom he tapped out in the second round. So he's looking to make it five in a row, move ever closer to the top of the rankings, maybe the title picture. He had been scheduled to take on another rising prospect in Nursultan Ruzaboyev, but uh, Ruzaboyev was forced out of the fight on October 9th in steps Abus Magomedov. The 33-year-old Dagestani is 25-5-1 overall. He is 1-1 one one since joining the UFC out of a variety of different promotions, but maybe most famously as the middleweight runner-up from the first season of PFL back in 2018. Uh, he debuted in the UFC with a like 15-second knockout of Dutz and Stoltzfus, uh, came back and took on Sean Strickland in the headliner of UFC on ESPN 48, where he got knocked out late in the second round, a loss that to say the least, has aged well. But he's going to look to bounce back from that here with this short notice booking against Bahalio. He is not favored to get it done. Uh, Bahalio is minus 260 or so. Magomedov plus 200 on the comeback. Keith, buy or sell. Kyle Bahalio will fight for a UFC belt before he retires. Um, oh, that's a good one. Sell. Okay, but you had to think about it for a sec. Oh yeah, yeah. Just I was just I was just trying to think of the vision. I mean, it, and they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Not, not a lot of confidence in that one. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you told me Sean Strickland would be UFC champion, I'd be. I would have laughed at you. So. Yeah. Uh, buy or sell? He beats Magomedov badly on Saturday. Uh, beats him and, badly. Yeah. Like okay. stoppage or, or worse than worse than thirty twenty seven scores. So Okay. Tell me how you think this fight goes. I didn't I didn't say he won't win. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, um you know what? I I, I think so Mega Manoff, you know, he, he lost his last fight to Sean Strickland, and I, I think I don't think there was a lot of people on the bus and there was a lot of controversy about him getting the title yeah, I don't mean to say title shot, but uh, a main event. You know, there was a lot of controversy, not a lot of excitement. A lot of people were like, "What the hell? Like, what a weird matchup." But he's he's got more skills than he gets credit for. I mean, he's a long and lengthy striker who's very athletic. He can fight out of both stances. He's he's pretty fast. He's got some good pop in his hands. Uh, I, I like that he throws a lot of lead hand punches. So even though he's switching, he'll lead like he'll switch to southpaw and then throw, you know, his left hand. They'll switch to orthodox lead with his straight right. Just something that a lot of people aren't looking because a lot of times you're fighting, you might be looking at that lead hand and he's throwing the rare hand instead. Uh, he attacks with a lot of combination. Uh, he switches stances in mid combo, which you know I like. He rips the body, throws a lot of kick kicks, good good kicks too, good high kick. I mean, he he front kicked Dustin Stolfus into oblivion and then followed up with you know shots, uh, good calf kicks. Uh, he will throw some naked kicks, so he's open to that. He's a good wrestler, uh, pretty good grappler, good back takes. He is a submission threat. 
Uh, the big concern I have is what happened against Sean Strickland, you know, in the second round. He looked so good in the first round, and then he faded. And he hated the pressure for Sean Strickland, which a lot of people, hell, Izzy Adesanya didn't like the pressure for Sean Strickland. Yeah. So, uh, Bahario, I mean, the, the guy's a huge middleweight. I mean, he looks like a freaking, he looks like a heavyweight. <laughs> you know, he's he's long and lengthy, uh, though actually he's shorter and he got less reach than Megan Maradoff in this fight, which is, uh, you know, surprising to me. Uh, he's a southpaw. He he's well rounded. He marches down his foe, accurate. Uh, I love his straight shots. Good kicking game. Throws a flying knee. Uh, he does keep his chin in the air. Uh, he he can he can wrestle a little. Um, definitely more of a Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappler than you know your traditional wrestler though. Uh, good tops game. Uh, inches at a time as he's advancing on the ground. Good back takes. Uh, if he gets his hooks in, he's almost impossible to get his get out because he has such long legs, um, and he doesn't rush submissions. Uh, though he did against Mahmoud Moradov, which was surprising, but he has a submission threat and really green, the really mean ground and pound. Uh, he's he's a weak defensive wrestler though. Like I mean, he struggled to get off his back against Moradov when he was taken down, uh, but he showed really good cardio in that fight. It was was going hard late in the third round. Uh, I think this is a really good matchup. So that when you ask me buy or sell, you know he smokes him. It, I think the I think the betting lines are 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 out of whack. I think it should be. I mean, what'd you say? The what was it? What, how big of a favor was he? Well, Holly was like minus two fifty, minus two sixty on most of your books. Like, yeah, I mean, I get favorite. it, probably because what we just saw with um, Mega Manoff, but and and the short it, notice, I'm sure it, helps. Yeah, the short notice obviously helps. Um, it's only 15 minutes, which makes me feel a little bit more confident in, in Megan Madoff in that sense, um, though he did fade in his last fight. But that loss has aged well. I mean, it's the current champion he lost to, and he looks sensational. He won the first round. He won pretty dominantly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think both guys are good. I do think Bio has a big advantage on the ground if he's on top. But Magomedov might actually be the better wrestler. I mean, he took down Strickland. Uh, I think Barrow might have more pop on the feet, but Magomedov actually probably has a little bit more variety. Uh, so that's why the lines are off. Uh, I think this is a much closer matchup. I think we might have a little bit of war on our hands. You said, uh, you know, buy or sell. Bahar, you know, win, what was the exact word you said? Like A, uh, a stoppage or, or worse than 30-27. Yeah, you like, like a dominant victory. Uh, I was selling that. You know what else I'm gonna sell? I'm gonna sell that. I'm gonna sell that he wins. I'm gonna go. Magomedov pulls off a big upset. I'm gonna say Magomedov wins a split decision based on his output and his kicking game. All right, uh, I like it. The crowd in São Paulo will not like it, uh, and will be robbed of whatever just delightful, joyous celebration uh, Bahalia would have given us. I I don't know why Keith hates fun, but I like uh, I like his pick <laughs> and I like all the the reasons behind it. Uh, in, in kind of scouting Abus Magomedov and going back to a lot of his fights, I, I swear I'm not going to use this comparison every single week when we do these previews, but I said this uh, two weeks ago when we talked about the debut of Shara Bullet, like Shara Boudin uh, Magomedov in, in the UFC, where fighters from Dagestan, there are two basic archetypes. Uh, the, you know, the the stockier broader guy who's a lockdown lights out wrestler and grappler and they develop their striking to various to various levels like they become a very good striker like islam makachev they never become more than kind of rudimentary like uh rustam habilov and then there's the ones who are longer lankier they can wrestle i mean they're from the mountains they can still wrestle but they're they're more of a kickboxer they tend to have a surprisingly exotic game like lots of stance switching some of them are into spinning stuff and i said that shara bullet was more like a middleweight uh zabit than a middleweight khabib uh abus megamadov has a little bit of that he can wrestle uh, in, in pfl when he was faced with fighters whose best route to beating him was to kickbox him he wasn't afraid to take him down people like uh Sadabusi. but by preference yeah he's a kickboxer at range you you mentioned that uh, you know, just subtle stance switching. Not like a guy that, you know, I, I learned three months ago, 
you know, how to fight out of Southpaw. So here, now I'm fighting out of Southpaw. No, a, a guy that does it smoothly uh, in, in the course of his techniques, uh, uses his range to his best advantage. Um, he hits with a surprising amount of pop for a guy that he never looks like he's swinging super hard on anything, but just proper technique, sitting down on, on his punches and kicks, uh, lands with good effect. The, and you're right, man, he looked good winning the first round handily against Sean Strickland. And Sean Strickland, three months later, less than three months later, would go on to soundly outstrike one of the greatest strikers in the history of the sport. I his very next fight. It's hard for things to age better than that. I almost feel like whoever wins this, I'm just going to wish I'd ended up getting to see it on a full camp for both guys. Uh, I am leaning Bahalio here. I, I think even if, even if Magomedov has success on the feet in the first round, even if Bahalio tries to take him down and can't early on, the passage of time is going to favor Magomedov. Bahalio's tendency to come forward and force the issue with his opponent, I think is going to make Magomedov uncomfortable. And if he has any incipient gas tank problems, I think it's going to bring those to the forefront. So I could see Bahalio getting a submission or a TKO with ground and pound late. Uh, once Magomedov is maybe tired, taking some damage. In fact, yeah, that's that's my pick here. Uh, give me Bahalio to fight through a surprising amount of adversity and get a win on the ground in the third round. I'm going to say it's TKO ground and pound, but one of those things where he pelts him until he turns his back and then chokes him out would be almost as likely for me. But let the record show that you are much braver than me for picking the upset here, and I do see the routes to it. Third from the top. On the main card of UFC Fight Night 231 is a heavyweight matchup between Rodrigo Nascimento and Dante Mays. It is a fight that if you squint real hard, you might think it's the main event starting. Or, you know, you're, you're driving along, you got your kids in the back of their car, and one of them's like, Hey, Dad, can we get Giles and Almeida versus Derek Lewis? And you're like, no, we got Jonathan Almeida versus Derek Lewis at home. And then you, you get home and you show you show him Rodrigo Nascimento versus Dante Mays. I, <laughs> if it was it was it if you ordered that fight on Wish. <laughs> yeah, you, you you ordered Almeida versus Lewis on Wish, and you, you get uh, Nascimento versus Mays. Uh, it is the rematch that apparently somebody was asking for. But at any rate, it's it's what we got. Uh, Nascimento, the 30 year old Brazilian, is 10 and one with one no contest overall. He is three and one with one no contest in the UFC. He uh, joined out of uh, season three of Dana White's Contender Series, beat Mays in his UFC debut, tapped him out in the second round. Uh, he then went on to lose to Chris Dawkins, had a weird fight against Alan Bodeau where he beat Bodeau, but then he tested positive for Ritalin of all things. Uh, I mean, I could use some Ritalin to stay awake through an Alan Bodeau fight too, but you can't do that uh, when, when you're getting tested. But he is on a two-fight win streak right now with split decisions over Tanner Bozer and Ilir Latifi. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> he's going to try to make it three in a row and hopefully in more emphatic fashion against Mays. 31-year-old uh, Kentucky native is 10-5 and five with one no contest overall. He is three and three with one no contest in the UFC. He is coming in off a win. He last fought back in June at the Cara France versus Albazi fight night, where he knocked out Andre Arlovsky in the second round. Odds here, uh, unsurprisingly, considering that they fought just a couple of years ago and both of them look like largely the same fighters. Uh, Nascimento is a moderate favorite. He's minus 180, Mays plus 150 uh, on the comeback. Keith, how do you see this one going? Who wins? How much do you care? Um, no. A answer those in any order you like. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not like the most excited about heavyweight, like low level heavyweight talent. So, I mean, it, I, I hate being that negative guy. I want to say, oh, this is going to be really fun. And it could be. Um, I just, I'm not expecting it to be. Um, there are like, five fights on the prelims that deserve to be higher than this. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but but listen, I want to be very 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 clear. Like I will take a terrible heavyweight fight like this over watching the best baseball game. 
you know, or the best boxing match, you know? So, um, Dante Mays, he, he, I feel like we've broken down a million times too. Um, uh, he's, he's a big dude, not very athletic. Uh, he tries to move a lot. Uh, he will do like flying knee, but I've said this before. It's more about being a poor fight IQ than a sign of his athleticism. Uh, he he will fight out of both stances, not the best output, kind of slow. He's got good power, but he really telegraphs his shots because he drops his hands and throws these looping shots. Uh, he also like throw lead up a cut, which you know we hate. Now he obviously is a legend because of his Kentucky judo background. Yeah, uh, you know uh, he's he he gets some clinch takedowns. He did against Josh Parisian, but he's a weak defensive wrestler. Uh, he plays BJJ off his back. Um, he if he's on top, he he, he can advance. He's better. He's, he's not a bad topside grappler. Um, I even seen him hit a crucifix, but he can be submitted. I mean, he got submitted by Nascimento when they fought a couple of years back, uh, and his cardio is bad. Um, he's gassed out in the past. Nascimento, southpaw. He's a good athlete for a heavyweight. Uh, a bit of a brawler on the feet, though. He likes to get in the pocket and throw heavy leather. Uh, his left hook being his best shot. Uh, thudding kicks. Uh, he loves a high kick. Uh, he will drop his hands and keep his chin high in there. He's going to get clocked, you know, cold. And and even though he's beating Maze, Maze is the guy that can do that. Uh, he he likes to close the distance and get inside and, and get the fight to the ground with, you know, trips and, and, and different upper body takedowns. Uh, but he also can shoot from distance. Good ground and pound. He is, you know, got some submission skills. Definitely, He's also like a top side grappler. He's got six subs, including Maze. Uh, I'm I'm gonna go with Nascimento to go to two and zero against Mays. I, I I think he's better than him everywhere. That said, I I don't think it's gonna be a quick stop. Just I think we might get like a lot of clinching and a lot of slapping titties and just an ugly heavyweight scrap. Give me Nascimento by decision. Yeah, I'm I I'm with you here. Just Mays, and this is something I said about. Jared Vandera. That's that's who it was. That after watching more than a few times, I'm not sure what he does at a UFC level other than be absolutely huge. Like he's one of the biggest guys in the division just in terms of height, wingspan, what he probably actually weighs in the cage, but doesn't really use that enormous bulk to his best advantage, doesn't have the kind of power you would expect from a guy that big and is really slow. Uh, he's officially three and three with one no contest in the UFC, but it's worth noting that the no contest was him getting ragdolled all over the place by Hamdi Abdel Wahab and then Abdel Wahab testing positive for an entire Egyptian CVS worth of horse steroids and, and it getting overturned. But part of me suspects that his Kentucky judo would not have stood up uh, even against a, a clean uh, Abdel Wahab in, in that fight. Nascimento has lots of routes to victory here. And Mays really only has one that I've seen proven, and that would be to kind of outland, clinch, outland, smother for three rounds, or at least two out of three. That seems unlikely against a more dynamic fighter that's almost as big in the form of Nascimento. Uh, give me Nascimento in a one-sided decision here as well. And, and like you, I expect this will be not be, it will not have much rewatch value. That brings us to the co-main event of UFC Fight Night 231. It is a welterweight matchup between the undefeated Gabriel Bonfim and veteran Nicholas Dalby. Bonfim, 26-year-old Brazilian, younger brother of Ismael Bonfim, who uh, opened up the main card, is 15-0 as a professional mixed martial artist. He is 2-0 since joining the UFC out of the sixth season of Dana White's Contender Series. He has back-to-back -back under 90-second submissions of two solid UFC welterweights in Munir Lazez and Trevin Giles. The most recent of those, the Giles win, was at UFC 291 in July. He will look to make it three in a row, mint himself one of the very hottest prospects in this division against Dalby. Uh, Dalby, 38-year-old from Denmark is 22 four and one with two no contests overall he is six three and one with one no contest in the ufc 
Uh, he has, however, had two different stints in the UFC. He, but not to put too fine a point on it, washed out of the UFC on back-to-back -back losses back in 2016, returned to Cage Warriors by his own admission, struggled with depression and alcohol problems that he put behind him and then strung together an impressive win streak to make his way back to the UFC where he is five and one with no con with one no contest since being back and is on a three fight win streak uh, since his last loss which was to Tim Means a little over two years ago he has back-to-back -back wins over Claudio Silva, Warley Alves and Muslim Salikov. The most recent of those, the Salikov win, was at the Vittori versus Cannoneer fight night back in June. Odds here, Keith, we got two fights left. One is Bonfim versus Dalby. The other, of course, Almeida versus Lewis. Both of them have lines as wide as the Grand Canyon. One of them is the widest line on the card. Who is the biggest favorite on the card? Almeida. I am afraid you're wrong, sir. <laughs> favorite on the card, Gabriel Bonfim. The best I can find on Bonfim is minus 550 with Dalby wow. coming back around plus 375. Dalby's good, though. He's a tricky guy. I, he's you're like saying, a, you're he's saying all achiever. the things. Yeah, you're he's saying an over all the things that I uh, would, that I said when I saw the line. Bonfim is minus 550 at best. He's bigger than six to one favorite on a lot of cards that puts him in the top five percent of biggest favorites like on the year in the ufc i'm sure he's the biggest anyone has been a favorite over nicholas dalby and that includes muslim salikov who was a big favorite over dalby and dalby beat him just in his last fight it's it's something dalby is an overachiever and usually when you say someone's an overachiever it is someone with bottom shelf physical tools we say overachiever about Darren the Roxanne Modafferi's and Darren Elkins's of the world. Dolby's not that bad an athlete. He's a good sized guy for the division and he's skilled and he overachieves on top of all that. He's like an Anthony Hernandez. Oh, I mean, the that, skills there, but like he still gets better than he people think he is. That's very good because a lot of, especially his higher profile opponents have more evident athleticism. They have more sizzle to him. No, he, and, he's, he, he's a lesser Bilal Muhammad. Because Bell Muhammad is an overachiever. Yes. I know there's jokes about Bell Muhammad and all this stuff, but like, the guy's freaking good. And but then you watch him, you're like, you don't see anything that jumps out at you. He's just he's no. smart, he's intelligent, he fights well, and super, super tough and persistent. Like a, a guy his size with his athleticism shouldn't be the lockdown wrestler that he is, but he is. But this is not a Bilal Muhammad fight. This is a Nicholas Dalby fight. Uh, Dalby, well rounded, wasn't always. Uh, you know, he was a striker by preference coming up, uh, you know, had pretty good striking heavy matches with Eliseo Capoeira, whom we talked about earlier, Darren Till, but, uh, you know, in his first UFC run, kind of came up against the wall against not the highest level guys. That's why I was happy to write him off. I mean, Zach Cummings was good in 2016, but Peter Sabata and Carlo Pedersoli were never good. And he lost to both of them. Uh, <laughs> those are the days you don't expect to hear a lot. <laughs> No, but um, since he's yeah. been back, uh, when he beat Daniel Rodriguez, that was still a good win. Claudio Silva, Warley Alves, Muslim Salikov, none of those guys are bad. And no. Muslim Salikov is good. And yeah. he's he supplemented what was a p fairly straightforward boxing, kickboxing game with, he's gotten bigger and stronger physically. I mean, he's been 170 pounder the whole time, but he you look at him in 2015, 2016, and now he's just got more muscle on his frame and he uses it to good advantage. Uh, he's good. Uh, he's become a good wrestler. He's good at using the clinch to stifle guys with that are faster than him with longer reach, become a bit of a neutralizer, which makes it sound like he's a boring fighter, but he's not. Most of his fights are blood and guts wars. We're talking about a guy that literally has a no contest on his record because there was so much blood in the cage that it was unsafe to, to fight on. It's one of the more disgusting things you'll, you'll ever see. Uh, unfortunately, here, I can't agree with anyone being like a six to one, well, anyone short of like the title picture being a six to one favorite over Nicholas Dalby, but I understand why Bonfim is a big favorite. Of, you mentioned that of the two Bonfim brothers, he's the one you're higher on, and I would agree. Uh, he has just bigger frame. He's younger. While both of them are very athletic, 
I think Gabriel has the edge there. It will always be confusing to me that the bigger Bonefiend brother is nicknamed Little Hammer. And, you know, the, and I know it's because Ismail is older, but yeah, it'll, I'll, I'll have to look it up every single time we preview their fights. And, you know, they're going to fight on the same cards every time forever. But, I mean, Bonfim, if, if you look at his record on paper, if you watch his contender series appearance and his two fights in the UFC, submission specialist it is what would jump out at you. But he's a very good striker, too. Uh, you know, throws a good variety of strikes, whips some hard kicks to the leg and body, has fast hands, has you know, some defensive lapses that thus far he hasn't really had to pay for. Obviously he's undefeated. Somebody's going to find his chin cleanly within his next couple fights. Maybe it's Dolby. We'll see what we get when that happens. But here, as much as Nicholas Dolby has avoided being overwhelmed by bigger, younger, better athletes, I think this is, this is going to be kind of a turning point as great as the story of Nicholas Dalby has been, uh, I, I think Bonfim is going to run over him. We may, we may see some things that we haven't seen from Nicholas Dalby in a long time, like uh, him getting beaten to the punch badly, him getting like explosive high amplitude takedowns where Bonfim is just in on his hips, hoists him and throws him. Uh, once they're on the ground, Dalby is super resilient on the ground. Uh, very just good offensive grappler, very good survival skills on the ground. He's, he's been under some good grapplers and, and held his own, but I, I do think Bonfim's just going to be too much for him. Uh, I think Bonfim probably gets him down in the first round. If he wants to, I would expect Bonfim to really take over this fight by the second round. I could see him taking down Dalby, softening him up with ground and pound, advancing position, taking the back, choking him out. Dolby's the kind of guy that's probably going to nap rather than tap. I'm not going to predict technical submission, but uh, give me Bonfim by second round submission here in an eye-opening kind of level up moment that has people, again, asking, is he the next Hamzat, the next Shavkat? Does he, does he, is he passing Ian Gary on the shoulder as they zoom up the freeway? Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. What a great division. I mean, besides you know the, how exciting the top guys are but when you get guys like Bonfim coming in and and all the other big prospects you, you're talking about is you know like the yeah, Ian Gary's and, and stuff I mean what a freaking incredible division <laughs> when I talk about Rachmanov and then guys like and there's other guys that we're not even thinking of right now um I mean Bonfim is as talented as they come I like, mean dude, he's Jack De La Madalena is is just kind of out there. He still hasn't lost in the UFC, but we don't even talk to him, talk about him anymore because he got a close fight against Baz uh, know, Basil Hafez. I know. I know. Yeah, I know. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely. Like, right. There's a guy on like a 17 fight win streak that we're, that I forgot to mention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, That's good. The guys are this, this freaking division, dude. The guys. I mean, look at the, I mean, I mean, obviously he's a champion, but look at the champion. Look at the run the champion had to go on to get. And I know some of that has to do with personality and other bigger personality in the division, but still like look at the run that Leon Edwards had to go on just to win the title. Uh, man, what a, what a freaking, and, and we've lost people in the division that are exciting guys. Like, you know, you know Shemaya had to, you know, move up to middleweight and Usman might now, I don't know if he's going to stay at middleweight or whatever, but uh, what a good division. Well, in, in, in Bonfim, I mean, he's as talented as they come. I mean, he's, he's a pressure striker that, is an absolute finishing machine. I mean, 15 fights, 15 stoppages, high volume striking. He's a pressure counter striker that slips and rips so well. Uh, though he does make the mistake of pulling his head straight back a little bit, which which I don't like. He keeps his chin a little too high, but he's so fast. Fast hands. I love his check, left hook. Uh, not the most technical wrestler, but he's insanely strong. I mean, he grabbed Trevin Giles and just threw him, slammed him. And and he is a wizard on the ground. Serious submission threat. Twelve subs. I mean, he subbed Lazaz. He subbed Trevin Giles. I mean, his guillotine is off the charts. Like how quick he jumps on it. Uh, Dolby's Dolby's tough though. Dolby's gonna Dolby's gonna match his output. He's a high output striker. He, he you know he beats fighters with pressure. Uh, I see he's pretty good at striking. Constantly switching stances, kind of getting his opponents guessing. Throws with a lot of variety. 
he does have some defensive holes. Uh, you know, he trusts his chin a little too much. Uh, you know, he gets in. Yeah, you know, he wants to just follow it into the pocket and then land some big shots. Uh, he really lacks head movements. He can be a little too aggressive and open to counters, overextending at times. Uh, but he's got some. He's, I mean, you mentioned it, he puts a lot of power. You know, muscle on his frame, so he's got some pop. Good kicking game. A lot of cheap kicks. He loves that Holly home like side push kick thing. He's a he's he's not a, the greatest wrestler, but he's like a sneaky wrestler. Like he'll do he'll get enough takedowns to help him win rounds. Uh, though he's a weak defensive wrestler, I mean, Claudio Silva took him down a bunch. Uh, but he can catch a submission. He's got four submissions in his career, and he showed like how tough he is in submit when he was avoiding all those submissions from Claudio Silva in that fight. And he has a cardio to go hard all fifteen minutes. Uh, you know, a big concern with with uh, Dolby is that his age. I mean, he's already thirty eight. He's turning thirty nine next month, which is you know I, much older than I thought. And he's and he's he's got a lot of miles on it. If Dolby can. Dude, yeah. he, he, he and Pichelle can, like, go to Denny's for dinner at, like, 4 p.m. Yeah. together and, like, yeah. at that discount menu. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I mean, if Dolby – like, him being the biggest favorite on this card, you know, over Dolby and Bonfin being over Darby is – I don't agree with it, and I mean I understand why, but I don't agree with it in the sense that there is an avenue for victory for for Dolby, and that is just he just tires Bonfim out. He just does what he does, keeps the pressure on him, keeps the the you know the beginning rounds close, you know first round maybe midway through the second, and he just takes over with cardio and volume. The longer the fight goes, the better I, I like his chances of winning. That said, I think Bonfin's special. I, I think he hurts him on the feet. I think he, he he I think we have one of those holy shit, he just did that to Nicholas Dolby. I think he hurts him on the feet and I think he jumps on a submission and uh I think he taps him very first round. Give me Bonfin by first round submission. All right, that is two emphatic picks for Gabriel Bonfim to pass his newest test with flying colors. With that, we come to the main event of UFC Sao Paulo, a scheduled five round heavyweight attraction between the red hot Jailton Almeida and perennial contender, Derek Lewis. Almeida, the 32 year old Brazilian is 19 and two overall. He is five and zero oh since joining the UFC out of season five of Dana White's contender series. He is four and zero oh at heavyweight or at least past light heavyweight. He did have a 215 pound catch weight fight against Anton Turkali. But at any rate, five outings, five wins, five stoppages, four of them in the first round, the other in the second round. It has been about as dominant a run as you could possibly ask for, even as he's moved up into the ranks of former fringe contenders like Shamil Abdurakimov and then current fringe contenders like Jairzinho Rosenstrike, whom he demolished back in May in the headliner of UFC on ABC4. As we mentioned during the intro, he'd been scheduled to take on Curtis Blades. Blades was forced out with uh, what he revealed later was an ankle injury on October 9th. In steps Lewis. Lewis, 38-year-old uh, Houstonian, is 27 and 11 with one no contest overall. He is 18 and 9 in the UFC. He is coming in off of a win. Uh, entering his last fight back in July at UFC 291, he was on a three-fight losing streak, all three of them by stoppage. It seemed to be very much the downward spiral for Lewis as he approached 40, but out of nowhere, he showed up looking in the best shape of his career and absolutely put the screws to Marcos Pizal in 33 seconds salvaging well at, at least enough shine to get this kind of short notice call it's hard to imagine he would have gotten this call if he'd been on a four fight losing streak but here enough interest to to get him the trip to sao paulo the payday and a shot at shocking the world and a shock it would be since although i quizzed keith and keith got it wrong he wasn't wrong by much as almeida is bigger than minus 500 on most of your books the best uh, odds I could find were Almeida at minus 450, Lewis around plus 350 or plus 360. You mentioned, and I fully agreed with you during the intro, that Lewis and Blades present almost polar opposite 
styles for Almeida to deal with. But the only problem is he seems to be up to the challenge on both sides. If we were previewing the Blades versus Almeida fight, I would be asking, is this the is this the night that we find out that Curtis Blaze is no longer the best wrestler in the heavyweight division? Do we find Almeida stuffing his takedowns? Do we find Almeida taking him down? I don't know whether I would have picked it to happen. I luckily, you know, more than two weeks out, I'm, I'm not doing tape study yet, but those are the questions I would have been asking. Here, he's taking on literally the UFC's knockout king. Uh, and, you know, I'm asking... Is this the night we find out that Derek Lewis might not be the hardest puncher in this division? Uh, Almeida seems to have it all. He came up primarily as a grappler in his early run, but his just physical power, his physicality, his athleticism is such that he has taken naturally to striking. He's become... I mean, there's something of the green prospect about him, even though he has more than 20 career fights. I know it feels weird that a 32 year old who's going into his 22nd fight, like still has a prospect feel, but one that's heavyweight for you. And two, that's a guy in Almeida that was kind of a late bloomer. He was just killing low level guys in low level shows for a long time and then just burst onto the scene. It's kind of like Jacare where Jacare was obviously an incredible grappler, but once he turned his mind to striking, he actually became pretty good at it. Just he's a fast, strong, coordinated guy, hard worker in the gym, and he became a plus striker by the time it was all said and done. Another thing Almeida has in common with Jacare is that he immediately became a good takedown artist just because he is so fast and so strong. And with Jacare, it only got better as he learned actual wrestling technique you know, learned to to chain his techniques a little better, not to just rely on pure horsepower to finish takedowns that he shouldn't have been able to finish. Uh, Almeida kind of has all those earmarks. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to be the heavyweight Jacare, but if at the top end, that's I think that's what he, he comes out as. Um, here, Lewis, he redeemed a lot to me in the Marcos Ogerio de Lima fight. And honestly, more than the outcome of the fight, what I came away with that gave me the most to think about for this fight is that he showed up caring whether he won or lost. Like if he showed up silly, sloppy and fat and just happened to lamp de Lima, I'd be like, this is this, this fight's going to be a farce. But I mean, he showed up, there, there were memes about six pack Lewis. Like where was this guy for the last 12 years? Uh, he showed up literally in the best shape of his life and destroyed a good heavyweight striker in seconds. Just, he looked more alive than he did in any of his uh, previous several fights. And granted those were against top 10, top seven fighters in, in every case. But just the fact that, that Lewis is probably taking this fight seriously, even if he hasn't had a full cap to prepare for it means that there is the puncher's chance where hell there might not have been otherwise. Having said that, and as much as it pains me to pick against Derek Lewis, who is as beloved in Houston as any fighter is anywhere, Giles and Almeida is, is a rough matchup for him. It's the thing kind of like Sergei Pavlovich, honestly, where if if Almeida wants to take Lewis down, he probably can. Lewis's takedown defense has always been good. His get-up game has always been elite. But, you know, that slipped a little bit as, he's, as he approaches 40 and has had back surgery and all the miles. But also, if Almeida just wants to test his luck on the feet, that's the riskier route to victory. But he probably has faster hands. Uh... Lewis has always had an underratedly diverse striking arsenal. He's not just a winging overhand machine. We talked about it a million times. We previewed a million Lewis fights. This is a 275 pound man who throws head kicks and flying knees, uh, who has a, I always, I always call him Dustin Poirier in terms of his instincts in the pocket and his ability to land with power at any range from like 12 inches to 30 inches just by throwing the exact right punch while slipping his opponent's punches. Uh, 
which is something I thought had deserted him when he lost the way he did to Taito to, to Ivasa. But I still think Almeida could probably knock him out on the feet without even trying a takedown if he wanted. Just, And again, it kills me to say that about a Derek Lewis fight, but I think it's Almeida time. I'm, I'm more and more in on Almeida the more times I watch the tape on him. Even though there's not that much tape, he's killing everybody in, in minutes. I mean, I don't even know if he has 15 minutes of cage time in uh, his five fights. But the more I watch just the, the little subtleties, he's getting better from fight to fight. He has remarkable physical tools and the kind of work ethic where he is really, really just coming into his own now. Like, I think he'll be a better fighter two or three years from now and still as a heavyweight very much in his physical prime. As much as I'd love to see Lewis silence the crowd and say some really outrageous shit that the, that, uh, you know, the translators don't even want to translate. I don't think that's what we get. I, I think we get Al Almeida here. I'm going to say he gets a second round submission after winning a pretty lopsided first round, and it hurts my heart to say it. But yeah, Almeida, round two sub, and I don't even think we get the the, pun the puncher's chance moment. Yeah. Uh, man, we keep talking about guys that we've broken down fights with them tons of times. I mean, Derek Lewis is another guy in that category. Um, but he's a guy that I, I I never get bored of watching this guy fight. I mean, he's one of the most entertaining inside and outside of the cage. Yeah, he's this humongously big athletic heavyweight that, uh, you know, way more intelligent fighter than he gets credited for. Yeah, he, he tends to fight in sports where he lulls, 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 then he just explodes. And he's got super, I mean, ungodly power. I mean, it, you know, I, I'm broken record, but he's, and they're going to say it over and over again on Saturday, but most knockouts in the history of the UFC. I mean, he, he just has to graze his opponent and he can put them down. Uh, that said, don't be fooled by it. He's very accurate. He's way more accurate striker than he gets credit with. I like you said, he picks the, the right shot. That's, that's a good way to say it. Uh, he's good at measuring his opponent. And he's good at picking up the assignment. A perfect example is when the way he landed an uppercut on Curtis Blades, when Curtis Blades, shot it that wasn't just uh, you know he threw a lucky punch and he caught him like he timed it and he had and he measured him and it was the same double leg head to that side that he took him down with in the first round and when he tried it in the second lewis lamped him yeah and he'll, he'll do that with striking he just lulls 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 and and then he explodes or if you come in he's just good he's sitting on he's timing it and he catches it uh he'll 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 throw some high kicks. He'll throw some flying stuff. We saw that in his last fight. Uh, he has better. We've talked. You talked about this a couple of fights ago. He's a better gas tank than, than he gets credit for. It's he's one of these guys. He looks like he's tired because he has his mouth open enough, but he doesn't fight tired. You know he he has countless stoppages late. I mean, how many times have we seen this guy come back? I mean, he's got ice in his veins where he's losing and he finds a way to come back and win. Uh, you know, uh, a good fight to see his cardio is go back to the Ilya Latifi fight where, you know, he was able to win a grueling battle and win it with his cardio. Now, as far as grappling, he 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 never looks to wrestle. Uh, if he ends up on top, it's it's that's just how the fight had played out. He he wasn't initiating the wrestling. Uh, he's got some bad takedown defense, but he just like the way he fights on the feet. He's hard to hold down. He'll do the same thing. Hello, hello. And when he gets an open, he just explodes back to his feet. The problem is that was kind of always a narrative. And against Sergey Spivak, that wasn't the case. Spivak took him down, and he just couldn't get up, and he was quickly submitted. So is that true, or is the true what we just saw where he just can become in really good shape and, and he can still smash? Like, Is he the guy who looked like he was washed and done against Sergey Spivak, or is he looks like the guy that could – you know, make an unlikely run at the title. If everything goes right, you know, he can be a UFC champion. Uh, I think the answer is probably somewhere in between those two, which is, I know that's a cop-out thing to say, but, you know, going back to his skills, if he gets on top, he's got to be the scariest ground pound ever. Um, he he used to have this rock-hard chin, and that is something I'm a little worried about too. I mean, he, he's, I mean, uh, guys have taken him out with big shots. Um, 
you know, I think about like Tai Tuivasa put him out and stuff like that. So that's that's concerning to me too. Now, Jelton Almeida, we talk about Derek Lewis big. Jelton Almeida is big for the weight class, which is funny considering he used to be a weight class below. Long arms, long legs. He's got a 79 inch reach. Um, he's a serviceable striker. He's he's he does have power. He throws straight shots. He throws power. Uh, good kicking game. He throws a lot of kicks. Loves the deep kicks. Love the cap kicks. Um, he'll throw a high kick. Really good wrestler for the division. I mean, good entries. You can get him either from the clinch, uh, or he can get he can shoot on the hips, uh, and he's very strong. I mean, he he slammed Shamil Abdurakhimov. He surprisingly out wrestled uh, Nasrinov, who's a stand practitioner on the Contender Series. Amazing grappler on the ground, smothering top control. He's a def- he's he's a perfect example. You, you know, it's surprising to say this, but heavy, but he's a perfect example of seeing a guy who just doesn't rush anything. He's so comfortable. When a, when it fight hits the ground, he's not in a rush, just slowly inch and inch to secure a better position. When he you know, so he was, he's constantly advancing position, moving from guard to side control, and, and you know into whatever position he wants. Uh, has some great back takes. He's got ten submission wins. Uh, if he's on bottom, he can get yeah, you know, he's strong there too. He can get subs from the bottom. Now, I I don't suggest him pulling guard against Derek Lewis. I wouldn't want to ever be on bottom of Derek Lewis because of it's just his pure power. Uh, but I've I've seen him get some sweeps too on the back, so he's not one of these guys who just gets stuck down there. I am worried about his cardio because he only has one decision win in his career. Uh, but that you know, I'm not blaming him for that. I mean, it's hard to show off what you get. And, and, you know, it, it's one of those ways, it, it's a question about his cardio. It's not like, you know, he's got weak cardio. Uh, and, and then I, he's really, besides being on the ground, I should have said this earlier, he's not just jujitsu. Like, he's landed some good ground. I mean, he beat up Danilo Marquez, battered uh, Jardina Rose Strike with some, some good ground and pound. So that's something to watch for. This is striker versus grappler. And I, there is some truth, like if, if, Almeida decided to stand with Derek Lewis and he, and he starts him. I mean, just look at the guy. Obviously, the guy has power. I, I do think his striking is a little underrated. And it would be, be a combination of his striking being underrated and, and Lewis's chin might be shot. But to me, if I'm Almeida's corner or something, I'm like, dude, don't dare do that. Like, close the distance of me. Like, fight exactly like Sergey Spivak fought. Close the distance. Uh, you, you're a better version of of Sergey Spivak, and we saw what Spivak did to Lewis. Uh, if he takes Lewis down, I think he smothers him. I think he eventually locks the mission, and I think it's going to look like a Spivak fight. I think he's going to do it early. I think he's going to take him down. I think he's going to work him, and he's going to lock his submission in the very first round. Give me Jelton Almeida by first round submission. That is the Sir Dog Radio Network preview for UFC Fight Night 231. Almeida versus Lewis. I've been Ben Duffy. He has been Keith Schillen. If this is your first time watching or listening to one of our previews, first of all, thank you. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, We do our best to give as good a mix of in-depth analysis and occasional humorous asides as you'll find anywhere in this industry. Please do like, subscribe, uh, drop us a comment. Keith and I both man the comment section. We'd love to hear from you on these fights. If you think we're out of our minds, Each of us made at least one two to one underdog pick. So if you think we're out of our minds, you may well be right, but uh, sound off and, and we'll give you your propers. Most importantly though, join us for the recap. We'll be live on the SureDog YouTube page about 10 to 15 minutes after the main event. Keith takes the captain's chair. We'll talk about all 13 of these fights in reverse order, going from the heavyweight headliner all the way down uh, to that very interesting curtain jerker we'll talk about what was good what was bad what was surprising what was controversial there's always something but hopefully not as much as there was uh two weeks ago and talking about what's next for some of the notable winners as well as losers and talking with you the live chat on the youtube page is open that whole time so we're taking your questions your comments and your hot takes in real time we have a growing community of friends that hang out with us after the fights and we'd love for you to be part of it Uh, In between, now and then, thank you once again for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, and by all means, enjoy these fights. And again, please do hammer that like button.